good morning, YouTube, or wherever you're listening to me from. You don't have to just watch me. You can listen to me on um, your favorite podcast sites. I believe I'm on iTunes, Spotify, all those. I put it in one place and it gets distributed everywhere. So a few people have said that they um, would like to just listen to the people that I talk to um, while they're working through podcasts. So I just, just a reminder that you can do that. And also, big shout out to Chicken Picks, ET Guitars, and Summer Cable. I've got a whole bunch of swag that I'm going to give away from those kind sponsors. Uh, but what I need you guys to do is to jump over on Facebook and have a look for the Chit Chats with Git Cats um, group. And if you join that, I'm going to be hitting you guys up for some ideas because I am terrible with marketing and all the like. People tell me I'm getting some great guests on here, but I just need to get the word out. So my first uh, competition I'm going to run is for who can come up with the best way for me to give away my swag while promoting the channel. And I'm going to stop waving a pen around in your face because that's very rude because uh, I pointed out to my guests that I actually do take notes as we're going and I have nothing prepared. Because if I listen out... There is a ding dong at my door, and who is at my front door but none other than Mr. Scott Henderson? Hey, Scott! Hey, Rick. Oh, I get applause! Wow! Yeah, special, <laughs> man. I, I want to say thank you for joining me. Um, I'm glad you phoned in a, a little earlier. It's never smooth sailing when it comes to these things with audio interfaces and the like, but we got it sorted. Yeah, man, it's, it's all good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no problem. Now you're in sunny LA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's about five o'clock in the afternoon over there. Yep. You said something about the air conditioning before. Is it quite warm over there? It's hot. Yeah. yeah? It's it's yeah. It's hot here right now. We're in the middle of summer. Well, it's middle of winter here, and I live in a part of the world called the Gold Coast, which is known for its surfing beaches. It's it's almost like Hawaii or something in in summer, and uh, so this is winter for me. I got my beanie on. I do have a, a coat on, but it's actually quite warm. I might have to lose it. <laughs> now, Scott, you said there's a million interviews out there where you talk about influencers and the like, but I just want to know what initially sparked the fire for you to start playing the guitar. Uh, uh, like I tell everybody, Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin. Yeah, when I heard, I think there were some guys over at my house when I was a kid working forget what they were doing if they were gardeners or what they were doing but they had a a big am radio and they were it, it in those days they were actually playing led zeppelin 2 on the radio on am radio and they were playing whole lot of love even with the big middle section with all the noises and stuff and that was on am radio if you can believe wow. it but um, when i heard that solo of whole lot of love man i said that's what i want to do that's that was that was the turning point for me. I'd heard music before I'd heard I'd seen the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and stuff. and It was all cool. And I thought, yeah, you know, I was kind of into music because my dad had an acoustic guitar lying around all the time and he, he could kind of play. But I never really hit me that that's what I wanted to do until I heard Led Zeppelin, a whole lot of love. And I was like, yep, that is the shit. I love wow. it. Wow. So you said your dad had an acoustic guitar lying around. You know, I I was the same where there was a, a guitar lying around my house for many years and I, I never learned to play it. It was um, going to high school where you had to learn to play a song on the guitar that I actually picked it up and my teacher recognized, hey, you're, you're pretty good at this. You, you should stick at it. Um, did you at all have any interest in that guitar that was lying around? Yeah, no. I, I My dad taught me a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. He was in the country and he could finger pick, which is something I never really got that good at, but he was pretty good at it. And he could actually finger pick songs and sing those country tunes that he liked. And um, struggling, trying to, to, I could play the chords with my left hand, but I was no good at finger picking and I'm still not. But uh, uh, it was cool to watch him do that and to learn from him. Cool, cool. It's funny, we were talk talking before we started about how um, I get incredibly sick of my own playing and you said, yeah, you, you'd do the same. If I hear somebody else that plays something that's not remotely the way that I play, man, my ears just prick up and um, really gets me. So is it the same for you when you hear guys finger pick and the like? Are you just like, 
whoa, yeah, I wish uh, I could well, do that. I mean, there's just guitar players of every genre that do things that I can't do. You know, from Tommy Emmanuel, who is amazing, who can play all that fantastic stuff on acoustic guitar, to country players who play slide and bottleneck and, and that chicken picking thing, guys like Andy Wood, who can play amazingly fast and play all these beautiful country lines, Johnny Highland. Um, there's just so many guitar players. And then there's the jazz guys that have this whole, um, I would say, 40s vocabulary from Charlie Parker that I don't really have. I have some of it. I have enough. I have all I want. But, you know, I certainly haven't even scratched the surface. If I wanted to really study that kind of bebop music and become a bebop guitar player, that'd be a whole other world to, to go into. So no matter where you look, there's always guys that do things that you don't know how to do. And nobody will ever know the whole vocabulary of all different styles of music. So I don't think you can let it get you down because one guy can do something that you can't. So what? You know, you, you, you do your thing and try to be the best you can at your thing. And that's kind of what, to me, it's all about is being you, not trying to copy other people. You know that I really hear that. Uh, I was a little bit down for a while that I can't play jazz or I can't play country, and I'd hear these guys doing that. But then I'd hear those guys try and play just straight out pub rock the way I do, and I just think you can't do that. To me, it's the easiest thing ever. But it all comes down to what you listen to. It's easy for you because you've had experience at it, and they haven't. Yeah, you know, it's like there's nothing worse than or funnier than hearing like one of these amazingly complex jazz musicians who tries to play rock it's hilarious because they don't know the first thing about it you know yeah. they can't get a tone they can't make a vibrato they just don't i mean you hand a guy that's been playing hollow body all his life and hand him a strat he won't have the slightest idea what to do with it as far as getting an authentic rock tone and playing no experience no experience means he just ain't going to be able to do it it's going to take about 10 years of hard work like an experienced rock player has <laughs> gone through to sound like he sounds. And that's that's the beauty of it. It's like, you know, you can be in your own space and you can enjoy what other people do and, and love it and respect it, but not necessarily want to do it for yourself. Absolutely. 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 Now, you, you mentioned now, you playing mentioned the, the Strat the and how strat somebody who plays a holy body would be lost on a Strat. You, you're a Strat guy yourself, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. You, I've seen you with a, a beautiful Sir. A very beautiful color, too. I think it's pretty close to uh, this one I have here. Yeah, I have a bunch of different ones, but that's a Seafoam. That's pretty. Yeah, that's my main guitar on stage. I've been playing that same guitar for a while. Nice, nice. nice. That mine's a, a Friedman, uh, and I absolutely I love it. Um, mm -hmm. What's the attraction to the Strat for you? I don't know. You know, I started out playing a Les Paul, and then the keyboard player in the band I was in knocked it off the stand and broke the headstock, and he couldn't afford to buy me another Les Paul, so he bought me a Strat. <laughs> so that's when I started playing Strats, and I just never went back. It's a, it's to me the the Strats the most versatile of the electric guitars, you know, with all the, the five different positions of the pickups and so many different techniques you can do with the bar and, the, and where you pick on the string makes such a huge difference. And it's also more of a full range guitar than guitars with humbuckers. Humbuckers tend to be more in the middle and strats cover more of a full range from the highest to the lowest and everything in between. So I feel like I can get the biggest variety of sounds out of a Strat. So that's what I love about them. And I just love that tone. It's just amazing. Awesome. So do you have any Strats have that have got a humbucker in the bridge, in the bridge? as well? Or? I have one. I haven't played it in about six or seven years. You know, I, I've got this theory when it comes to single coil versus humbucker guitars, because I've got a whole bunch of Strat style guitars just over yonder there. And some with single coils in the bridge, some humbucker. And to me, using the right single coil in the bridge, it can be a bit of a hard task trying to find the right one that's not too cutting. But when I find the right one, it's more like I hear the sound of the string, uh, the, the guitar, as opposed to if I've got a humbucker, I'm hearing more the character of the 
amp. I don't know if I'm yeah. if that's just something in my head or whether other people no no it's true i mean and also you're hearing more of the characteristics of the pickups because humbuckers have kind of their own mid-range sound more than single coils. single coils i believe are a little more transparent you know um there are some humbuckers like there's john sir makes this um humbucker that has it's different than like say putting a seymour duncan humbucker like a 59 that's meant for a les paul and a strat because then you're going to get a lot of mid-range and the spacing isn't right over the strings. You know, the screws don't go over the, the, the pole pieces don't go over the strings. But if you get a thorn bucker named after Pete Thorn um, that John Sir makes, it's a very, very low output humbucker. And the, the, the pole pieces are spaced for a strat spacing. And it sounds much more like a single coil. It's, nice. it's much more transparent, and you still get that Strat tone. It doesn't sound like a really mid-rangey Gibson pickup that you stuck on a Strat. Uh -huh. So there's a big difference in those two types of humbucking sounds. Okay. So if anybody's interested in getting a humbucker for their Strat bridge pickup to make it fatter, but you don't want to lose that really Strat, transparent Strat tone, a Thornbucker is a great choice. I'm going to have to look into that myself. Um, I'm sure there are other companies that make some pickups like that too. But that one I know because I have it in, in one of my guitars. Like I said, I haven't used it in that in a long time. But if I want it, I can get that thing, you know, cool. get that sound. Cool. cool. I'm pretty fond of a pickup I've got in one of my guitars made by Kinman Guitar Pickups. And mm -hmm. it's called the Big 9 and it's a single coil size, but it's voiced to sound like a, a P90. And that gets mm -hmm. me that, that halfway. I can do a cover band gig, and if I need some, have something where I need a humbucker, that will get me in that territory. But if I need that single coil mm -hmm. sound, it's kind of in that territory. It's just that, that in between. And Kinmans are noiseless, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, I had a Kinman on my guitar before John invented his noiseless system. Um, I have a live album that I use DiMarzio 2.2s. And then after that, I used Kinman's for a while. But then John invented the noiseless system on his guitars. And to me, that sounded much better. So I, now I'm using real single coil pickups. But there's a dummy pickup. It, it's not really right to call it a pickup because it's not really a pickup. It's a device that makes the guitar humbucking. But you get to still use real single coil pickups, which to me sound better than any of the noiseless pickups. So, um, but unfortunately that's only exclusive to Sir Guitars, but what some people are doing these days is they're using the Elitch system, which is, um, you can put that on the back plate. It comes as a back plate and there's wire in the back plate, which sort of, it's sort of like a little TV antenna and it's, it's inside the back plate and you wire that to your guitar and that will take about 80% of the hum away and you can use single pickups. Like if you have a Fender Strat and you want to make it into a noiseless guitar, the Elitch system is probably the best way to go. Nice. I actually had that in a, a Strat build that I did. Um, I took it out for the... When I originally had that guitar wired, it just wasn't right. There was too much wires going in there, so I pulled it all out. But I do have one of those lying around. Now, when you mentioned the Sir system, I assumed that's what you were talking about, the, the Elitch style system but sir's got no, something no well the sir sir had a contract with elich when he first invented the system when the first noiseless sirs came out there was actually wire in a channel route around all three pickups in the body it was like a like a like a square tv antenna that was in the wood a very very thin route um around all three pickups under the pick guard wow but um, John stopped using that system and he actually developed a better one, which uses a pickup, which is sort of like, it's, it, I keep saying pickup. It, it's the size of a pickup, but it's not a pickup. It's a device. Um, and it's just like under the pick guard, sort of right next to the, to the neck pickup in the middle pickup. And it, it's going into the guitar vertically instead of horizontally. It's going in vertically okay. yep. under the pick guard. And that's the pickup that's making 
it humbucking with the bridge and the neck pickup. Cool. And the the difference is, it's like if you put like Stevie Ray Vaughan put a real pickup under his pick guard, but that will really drastically change the tone. That's why Stevie Ray always turned the treble up quite a bit on his amps because that pickup is 6,000 ohms like a regular Strat pickup, and that'll that'll rob some, some tone from your guitar. Um, John's thing is 200 ohms. The human ear can't hear it. Cool. So it doesn't change the tone one tiny molecule. And um, I know because I had it on a switch. I wanted to test it. I didn't trust it. <laughs> I wanted to <laughs> test it. So I had him put the bypass for it on a push-pull switch on one of my treble knobs, uh, tone knobs on the guitar, where I could disengage the the extra pickup, and then all of a sudden all this hum would come in, and then I could just push it back in, and all the hum would disappear, and I found there to be no difference in the tone whatsoever of wow. the guitar, just that the hum disappeared. Yeah. So that's is that exclusive they've, they've, to to uh, John Sir guitars. Yes, it is. Yeah. I might have to save some money and get a Sir guitar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Smart man. Smart man. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah you, we mentioned you know, the Kinman pickups and the like, and you're right. Nothing sounds like a true single coil. There's just that bell-like quality. Uh, yeah. You know, ki- noiseless pickups. If you're playing at a medium volume, I don't hear much of a difference. In fact, you know, when I listen to my live album and I listen um, as a listener, you know, after the album's mastered and everything, tone sounds pretty good to me. But I remember when I was playing and loud, which, you know, we play pretty loud sometimes. And when you're turning up noiseless pickups to a certain volume, there's a frequency up in the high end that's kind of harsh it's just a little bit irritating and sing real single coils don't have that they're smoother and sweeter on the top end and there's something about noiseless pickups that when you get up to a certain volume it's kind of like ow there's something there that's harsh that bothers me but like i say i don't hear it on the recording but i heard it when i was playing okay so when you say harsh, you say harsh. Are you talking about like the, the three point two five kind of? No, I'm talking about more like the twelve k up, up area. that high. Okay, way up high. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like I was, like I was trying we're to be up there, and and, uh, bring, up and uh, bring up just a general piece of useless knowledge that I carry around in my head. Uh, <laughs> the resonant frequency. Apparently, I was I was talking to an audiologist. The resonant frequency of your ear of your ear canal is three point two five, which is why that is such an annoying frequency to most of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, three point three is one of my favorite uh, frequencies to boost on my guitar when I'm doing a record, yeah. because it's um, it's annoying sometimes when the guitar is by itself, but it lets the it helps the guitar cut through the track because it's kind of a it's kind of a low treble, high mid range. Okay. And I find 2K to be the annoying frequency. Sure, like, sure. And I find 3 to be like, you know, Mike Landau told me about 3 when we were mixing my album Well to the Bone. And he says, I'm going to put a little 3 on this. And I was like, really? Because I usually put 5 if I want my guitar to be brighter. Yeah. You know, I would put 5K because I thought, okay, that's going to help it poke out through the mix and have a little bit more sparkle on it and make it easier to hear. He says, I've been using three. Tell me what you think. And he, and he compared three to five and I liked three better. I was like, wow, I never would have thought to even try three because I always figured that to be mid range. It's sort of in between mid range and trouble, but I really, I put it on my guitars all the time. I really like it. So are we talking a, a a narrow cue or a wide cue? No, like a bell, a bell. Yeah. 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 Nice. nice. I'm have to like in an octave, like an octave bell. Okay. okay. I'm going to yeah. give that a try. And then I usually take off a, a dB or two of 15 on a shelf because that gets rid of fizz. And sometimes you don't need to do that. If you've got cymbals going, there's really not a reason to do that because the cymbals will cover all that stuff up. But if you're playing like if there's a hi-hat going on and there's no cymbals... Sometimes that area of distortion 
can really get fizzy and nasty, hairy sounding, you know. So I'll just cut like a dB or two of that 15 K on a shelf or sometimes 12. And that sort of smooths out the top end and gets rid of a little bit of the fizz. But no, so you, you go for a shelf yeah. rather than a, a complete low pass filter. Yeah, on yep. th- that one, a shelf, because I don't want to get rid of anything under that. You know, I only got want to get rid of 15 and above because okay. that's where the really hairy, nasty stuff is. I don't want to mess with 10K because that sounds good. Sure. You know, now, so would so, you yeah, EQ anyway. your solo parts solo different parts. to um, to your rhythm playing? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm a layer, so I, I love to layer parts. I'm really big on that. Um if anybody's ever heard my records, you know, they know that there's like 40 guitars going on at a time. Um, but I do it in a way where it's very subtle and there's a lot of stuff. I learned a lot from working with Joe Zawinul from Weather Report. I worked with him for four years and he was the synthesizer expert <laughs> in in jazz. And he made beautiful records with Weather Report and he was very good at layering. And he would always tell me to always put stuff in the mix that people can't hear because they really do hear it. But it's so low in the mix that it's like a Star Wars movie. You don't hear it. You don't see it the first time you see it. You're going to see it on your fifth time you see the movie. You're going to notice something that you never noticed before. It's that kind of stuff. Okay. And it's real subtle. It's low in the mix. And it's usually EQ'd to stay out of people's acute hearing you know so it's either super scooped you know like you know like a like this kind of a thing and it remains very subtle in the background or it may be on one side mixed really low on one side or whatever it's just mixed in a way that it doesn't pop out at you it's just very subtle and you'll hear it sometimes and sometimes you might not hear it but um i love to do that kind of stuff and and it's funny that a lot of rock guitar players do that and people aren't even aware of it like um i just found a website where i could download about 21 of richie blackmore's original tracks without cool. the band cool. yeah and um what really surprised me is that you know when you hear deep purple you really kind of just or I was always under the assumption that he just laid down one guitar track and that was it. Except, you know, obviously there's some double leads on, you know, songs like Highway Star, you know, da 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 da. Of course there's twin guitars going on. But outside of that, it seems like there's only one track. Boy, that couldn't be further from the truth. There's like six or seven guitar tracks on every single cut. Really? But they're subtle. You don't hear them. They're back in the background. And if you listen, after I heard these tracks soloed, I went back to the record to see if I could hear them, and I could hear them, but I just never noticed them. And another thing that he he, he liked to do is he liked to double a part, but he would play on the left side, the part would be very mid-rangey, and on the left side, it would be very scooped with lots of treble and bass. When you put those two things together in stereo, it's a massive guitar part that you would just assume is one part because it's the same part, but it's actually a doubling. Nice. And sometimes he doubled those parts three or four times. And you go like, wow, no wonder it sounds so big. It's actually been doubled like three or four times. And then there's another thing going on, and another thing going on. And, you know, you expect that from Jimmy Page because he's kind of known for that. But maybe because Deep Purple had an organ player and maybe with the keyboards, you don't notice it as much that a lot of the guitar parts are doubled and there's a lot more going on in the guitar that you think that there is. But of course, in a trio setting like mine, you're going to notice it. Or yeah. like Mike Landau is also really famous for layering guitars on top of each other in a really nice way. And he's a... um a good friend of mine and he he's uh, I've definitely he's helped me um in teaching me some of the ways to do it nice nice and, and you know I, I mentioned I'm a, a total rock guy so you know ACDC and, and the like really cemented my my playing in my early days and Angus and Malcolm is exactly that where Angus mm-hmm. has got more of a e tone and Malcolm is more or 
but you mm-hmm. combine those together and you get it just yeah, takes up the well, full spectrum right yeah that's the whole point you know that's why like you know you play a strat on one section of a tune and then you grab a les paul to do another part and an sg to do another part and a dan electro to do another part and i've got like a I don't know. I've got like something like 20 guitars of all different types and I've got baritone. I've got a sitar. I've got Dan Electro 12 strings. I've got acoustics. I've got an electric dobo dobro. I've got an acoustic dobro. So I am all over trying to get uh, ambience and sounds in different tunes. So every tune doesn't sound the same. So I'm all about that and I love doing it. To me, it's one of the most creative processes about making music is not just the notes, but the sounds. It's so much fun yeah. to be artistic with those sounds. It's you know like being a painter. Nice. It's really well, fun. Well, Scott, just, just talking to you, just I, I can tell you've got a, a, a fair bit of engineering knowledge just in, in terms of you know, EQing and everything. Uh, is that something that you just picked up along the way from working with other great engineers that have passed it on, or is that something you've, you've studied Yeah, uh, to be honest, I can't really call myself an engineer because I don't know shit about drums. Um, I, I would not trust myself to mix and eq drums you know that i leave to a real engineer and the engineer that i use is a drummer so sure. <laughs> in fact he play he's the drummer that played on my vibe station album alan hurts and even after we stopped working together and i got a new bass player and drummer he still wanted to engineer the album because you know he's my friend and and he knows i love his work and he's a brilliant engineer and uh I wouldn't trust anybody else with drum tones. He's so good at at that. And I, I also have to say, I wouldn't even trust myself with bass either. Oh, really? Um, oh, really? I can't, not really, because there are elements of bass that involve compression. I'm not a very good compressor guy. I don't know enough about 3.1 versus 3.2 versus 3.4. I'm not that guy. Um, He is. Okay. Because I know that, you know, you can add you can add a certain amount of compression to the bass, but unless your bass player is Anthony Jackson or one of those amazing studio bass players where every single note they play is the same volume, you can't compress that away. If you've got a guy like my guy, he's an excellent Romain Labai, um, uh French bass player that played on my last album, People Mover. He's... He's a a motherfucker bass player. He's incredible. But he's not one of those studio guys that's going to give you the same exact volume on every single note. You know, he's his dynamics are kind of all over the place. So as is most are most bass players. So you're going to have to compress them to a certain point, but you have to know when it starts sounding artificial. And then you're just going to have to go in there and do it the old fashioned way and listen to every single note on the track. And if there's a note that gets lost, you have to pull that one note up with automation. And if there's a note that's too loud, you're going to have to pull it down. So there's still going to be a big, tedious amount of work, no matter how much you compress it. But compression helps to smooth it all out. I'm not the guy that's going to choose how much compression to compression to put on the bass sure, i'm gonna sure. leave that to someone that knows what they're doing it is a bit but, of a, a voodoo art the old compression you know i had yeah, um I, a, a very well-known australian guitar player goes by the name of diesel on last year and diesel was talking about setting his meters uh oh, not so much meters but just listening to the compression so that it pumps in time to your music and that's something i've always done you know you, you, you get the, the release to go in time with the music and mm-hmm. i had i never knew that you didn't know that <laughs> No. <laughs> okay, because I was going to say, I was so I really surprised today. that um, some very accomplished players said to me, man, I never thought of that, but that makes sense. And it's like, mm-hmm. oh, I must have read that very early in the piece and have been doing that. But mm-hmm. you, like you said about mixing drums, if you've got a parallel uh, path coming up underneath where you've squished the absolute crap out of your drums, get that pumping in time and the meter, you can see it sh- Wow, that's that's a that's a big secret right there. That's yeah, that's big. cool. I'm sure I'm sure my engineer knows about that kind of stuff, and that's why I, I let him do it. Yeah, yeah. But I I have learned through the years about recording guitar, and yeah. if anybody wants to know how to get those secrets, the fastest way you can buy my video. It's called the Ultimate Tone 
video. It's on my music masterclass. And I go through every detail of recording a guitar from, I mean, we're talking, it's the most thorough video I've ever done is every aspect of recording is covered from the string gauge to the pickups, to the tone knobs, to the guitar, to the, to the cables, to the interface to the mic preamp to the speakers and mic placements in the room the room coloration with panels i mean everything you'd ever want to know about recording that doesn't mean that i think my tone is the best um there's a section of the video that sort of deals with my personal tone but there's also sections of the video that kind of are more generalized and tell you in a general way some things to avoid and and some shortcuts to get you what you're looking for but yeah and where can people get this? Um, my Music Masterclass online. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. MyMusicMasterclass.com. Is yeah. That mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Yeah. Awesome. I'll be checking that out. Now, Scott, you, uh, I was first aware of you in guitar magazines back in the, the late 80s. And if I recall correctly, uh, you were teaching at uh, Musicians Institute. Do you still teach there? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, not much. One day a week for two hours. But I'm there. I'm an open counselor. And that's all I'm doing right now because I'm really busy um, with music. And sometimes I gear my schedule there to how much time I have. And right now I'm in the middle of composing and don't have a lot of time for for teaching at that point. Though I do have a bunch of online students, but that's here at home. I don't have to go anywhere. Sure, sure. sure, sure. So how did you get did from you get from that wow moment, that moment of hearing... Moment Led Zeppelin on the radio, on the radio to teaching, to teaching at, at MI. Was there a path to that? Did you? Oh, that was nothing. I just came to MI because I went to a school in Florida that I studied music theory there, but there wasn't really a guitar department. So I learned a lot. I wrote a lot of big band arrangements. I wrote a lot of, I composed a lot, but it was centered around compo- com- composition and arranging, not guitar playing. So when I learned that there was a school in L.A. where Joe DiOrio, Pat Martino, uh, all these heavyweight jazz guitar players were teaching there, I said, that's where I need to be because I can learn how to apply that theory that I learned in college onto the guitar neck. And I went there in 1980 and I've been teaching there ever since. Nice, nice. Nice. Cool gig to Mm -hmm. have. Yeah, it's great, man. It's fun. So... You, you said like the, the spark the fire was the whole Led Zeppelin thing, but you're known as a jazz blues player. How did that transition happen? Um, you know, from listening to uh, all different kinds of music. I'm I'm very big on keeping an open mind when it comes to music. Uh, there's I don't think there's anything I hate more than closed minded musicians. Um, I literally hate them. So. <laughs> that's a mean thing to say but that's how i feel you know in in america it's maybe more more prevalent than it is in other countries but we have the heavy metal crowd and they all wear their black leather jackets and and they they listen to nothing but metal and they would never think to listen to an artist like beyonce because their friends would make fun of them you know and they're missing out because there's great pop music out there and great artists like Beyonce and some of her tunes are amazing and she's amazing. And I love some of her music and I love quite a bit of her music actually. And I can say that for just about every idiom you could name, you name me country. I'm going to name you my favorite country artists. You name me soul and R and B. I played in an all black group for five years playing nothing but uh, James Brown, cool in the gang tower of power, you name it, all the Motown stuff. That's when I kind of discovered that I could have just as much of a love for that kind of music as I did for Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple and ZZ Top. And now, after listening to bands for many years like Weather Report, uh, Miles Davis, uh, all this kind of stuff that was sort of fusion, it brought me back to straight ahead jazz. And I enjoyed for many years studying John Coltrane and Charlie Parker and Joe Henderson and Cannonball Adderley, Herbie Hancock, and all the great jazz musicians out there. And that got me into jazz. So when it comes to like 
what do I want to be known as? I'm actually offended if you call me a jazz musician or a rock or a blues musician. I'm none of those people. I'm a musician. And I borrow things from all the musicians and the music that I love to throw in and mix into my own music. So I don't want to be categorized. I can't be categorized. And if you listen to my music, you can see why I can't be categorized because my music is all about variety. You know, if you listen to my music, you're going to hear rock, soul, funk, country, blues. You're going to hear everything. Maybe not opera, maybe not rap. <laughs> Those are the only two things I don't listen to that much. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but just about everything else, classical music. And my wife is a, is a classical doctor in classical music. Oh, really? So I am hearing the most amazing music all the time from these composers I've never heard of. And she's playing a piece and I'm going who the hell is that? And she's going, oh, that's so-and-so. He lived in the, you know, and he was born in 1910. He lived the whenever. And the music is just like blow away. And I don't even, never even heard of this dude. So there's all kinds of guys out there like that. But of course, we all know some of the really famous ones like Debussy and Ravel and Scriabin and Stravinsky and all those modern classical cats along with the guys that everybody knows like Beethoven and Bach and 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 Mozart and and Chopin and I love that music so um and I hear it every day and do you find and that kind of that kind of excuse me just I just one more point yep. that's probably why I love Gentle Giant so much because there's a great uh there's a great example of a blend of classical music and rock that those guys were unbelievable unbelievable band i saw him live like 10 times i was just such a big fan still am and yes and hatfield in the north and bill bruford and all the prog rock stuff i love it all and do you find it creeping into your own playing the, the music that you watch listening to of course yeah yeah i mean there's definitely elements of classical music in my almost everything i write because you know, if you listen to the bass lines in my music, the bass lines are all over the place. The bass lines are busy. Yeah. You know, the, it's not a guy just playing a root of a chord. <laughs> <laughs> my bass lines are melodies within themselves. They're going all over the place. My music would be nothing without the bass lines. And, yep. and, and the bass lines are ultra important in the music that I write. And so, and so is the harmony. And, and uh, I guess, you know, when some people hear my music and they hear all this harmony, they think jazz because that's the only way they can mentally relate, you know, compare it to something. It has to be compared to something for them to call it something. So I guess you hear jazz harmony, you compare it to jazz. But the truth is, is that harmony came from classical musicians and jazz musicians stole it. So there you go. Okay. Okay. Now, you know, when we are talking before about um, engineering and mixing and everything, and you mentioned that uh, a drummer friend of yours, um, you can't pull drum sounds, and that the guy that you get to mix is a drummer friend of yours. I have noticed that there's quite a lot of guys out there who are gun mixers that are ex-drummers, and it doesn't make sense to me because the guy that's going to have the worst hearing damage is going to be the drummer for just the nature of that instrument. <laughs> well, right? I don't know if I'd say that guitar players are, 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 are probably uh, prone to ear damage as well. But, you know, I noticed one thing about my, uh, you know, Alan, the, the engineer that I work with is he mixes so soft that if I'm sitting in the room and my chair squeaks, it pisses him off. Yep. Because yep. he mixes ultra soft and he'll only mix for like a half an hour at a time. And then he yep. takes a break yep. to clear his ears. And um, I can't believe how soft he mixes. And I and sometimes I, I have problem hearing what he's doing because mm -hmm. he'll go, you hear that? And I, I'll, I'll have to tell him, can you just turn it up a little bit? Because I can't really hear it. May, and, you know, I've had my hearing checked and it's actually okay. Really? But I'm I'm just not used to mixing that soft as as he is. Yeah. yeah but yeah. he gets the job done and it sounds great. So I'm not. Who am I to complain? I also noticed that about Mike Landau, he he actually had to take my computer and put it outside the room because the fan noise was bothering him. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, really? Wow. 
Yep. So super soft when yep. he's mixing. Yep. And that's and, uh, I'm I'm no gun mixer by any chance, but I uh, worked in radio in broadcast for for quite a while. Uh, and when we were mixing all our ads and promos that that went on air, it was always done whisper quiet, so you could just mm-hmm. hear it over the the ambient noise, and um, always like in on, in mono on just a, a cheap little shitty speaker just to hear what it would mm-hmm. sound like. Actually, we had a reel to reel four track reel to reel behind us, and I would pipe it through the little speaker on that to recreate the sound of a. Um, just an AM radio because that's what people would be listening to. And mm-hmm. most people have that radio on just loud enough in the background. So it's not annoying. They can just have it on all day. Um, so I totally do the same thing that you, you're saying Landau and your, your mixer, mixer guy does in that as low enough that my tinnitus will allow is the volume mm-hmm. I mix at. And I, I mm-hmm. did ask about uh, the drummers because I wanted to ask you about your hearing, but you said you, your hearing is fine. Yeah, I'm okay. I don't know how, because I've played loud for a long time. I don't play nearly as loud as I used to. When I was in tribal tech, that was a very loud band. And um, the bands that I do now with my trio are like half that volume. And I mean, we still get loud, but it's not excruciatingly painfully loud. Um, I have a master volume Marshall that I use and uh, that was modified by John Sir. And I have actually my own amp that was designed by John called the SH100, which is actually just a copy sort of of a 71 vintage Marshall, but it has a master volume. Yep. So with that master volume, I'm able to get some really smooth distortion tones without really having to crank up all that loud. I mean, you have to, you have to get the tubes, the power tubes hot, but you don't have to burn them. You know, they don't have to be cooking. Like on a Plexi Marshall, you would probably have to turn it up to seven or eight to get a crunch sound that would work with a pedal. And by that time, your ears are bleeding. With Absolutely. with my amp, Absolutely. with my amp, I only need to turn it up to like four at the the highest, and I can still get that same kind of saturation and not kill people in the audience. Uh, nice. So. Nice. Yeah, I so I don't need to play as loud. That's why, I, but I did for many years. So I'm really thankful that my hearing's okay and surprised actually that it is. And do you wear hearing protection? Wear hearing protection? No, I don't. Never really? have. Really? Yeah, it, it kind of kind of bugs me because I need to hear what it really sounds like, and I haven't found any ear devices that don't mess that up for me. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm well aware that the damage to my hearing was done as a teenager rehearsing four nights a week in a little shed with the drummer's symbol right beside this ear, because this ear just yeah. rings like you wouldn't believe. And, and it's from that I've worn hearing protection since then. Yeah. And it's just getting worse as I get older and you know, yeah. it's the damage done back then. That's one of the reasons I don't really dig playing it. There's a, there's a club in LA called baked potato and I, I don't really like playing there that much because the stage is too small. And the drummer, no matter where you set up, you're going to have a drummer's symbol in very close proximity to your ear. And it's rough. Hmm. And luckily, the drummers that I work with have empathy for that. And they know that you're hearing their symbol even louder than they're hearing it. Because it's closer to the ear of the guitar player than it is to their ear. And so my drummer will, will purposely ride the cymbal on his right side so that or his left side so that he doesn't hit the cymbal on his right side which is right next to my ear while i'm trying to play because that just causes things to snowball and before you know it you're in a state that makes me very uncomfortable playing because as much as i love rock and roll there's a point where your guitar gets out of control and it's feedbacking, and I'm not talking about feedbacking in a nice way, like feedbacking on the note you want it to feedback. I'm talking about like feedbacking in a bad way, like squealing and making yeah. weird noises, and everything just seems out of control. And I feel like it's sort of like what they say in the army when you get shell shock, and it's a really horrible nervous energy that makes you feel like you have to fill up every single space with notes. Because you're nervous and it's the volume doing that to you, making you feel just like, ah, I hate that feeling. I want to feel relaxed on stage. And I can feel relaxed at a medium to loud volume, but when it starts getting out of hand, 
I become nervous and wow. unrelaxed, and then I don't like it. I don't yep. play my best in, yep. under those circumstances. I do think that some people overcompensate with volume. Um, you said it makes you feel nervous. I think some people who are nervous want to turn it up and get to that point where it doesn't matter what I'm playing. Can you feel this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe in rock and roll, it's, it's a little different than, you know, the, in the kind of music that I play, is very conversational. Um, it's not about a drummer just playing a beat like a drum machine, the bass player playing his bass part. It's not that simple. Uh, I'm playing rhythmic ideas that my drummer and bass player are counting on me to play to make the solo interesting for them as well. So, I mean, it's not like I want them to copy what I'm playing because that's corny. But they will, if I get into a rhythmic motif, they will change what they're doing to, you know, accent or embellish what I'm doing and make it into more of a band solo than just a guitar solo. So it's very conversational music. And to play that kind of music, you've got to hear each other. When you're playing at such a loud volume that all you hear is sort of like a roar, you can't play the kind of music that I play. It's impossible. Or when you play in a room that's so boomy that I don't really hear bass notes. All I hear is bass frequency. I don't want to hear bass frequency. I want to hear bass notes. Mm -hmm. I want to hear the notes he's playing so that I can react to them. So there are often times I have to put up a second monitor and just have bass put in the monitor without the low end, but just the the top end so I can make out and distinguish the notes he's playing or I'd say like maybe the high mids because bass doesn't really have high end but you know yep. somewhere around you know 3k from 1k to 3k so that I can hear the notes he's playing because if I can't hear the notes he's playing I, I don't know I, it doesn't feel right to me I'm pl I, sometimes I feel like he plays these beautiful things I don't want to play over those beautiful things he's playing I want to let him play those things I want to stay out of his way he wants to stay out of my way and we don't want to step on each other which in rock you don't really have to worry about that so much because what the bass player is playing is so simple that you don't have to worry about it. You just yeah. play what you're going to play. He's just playing boom, 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 whatever. Yeah. Not in all rock bands, of course. There's some rock bands that are have some complex bass parts, but I'm just talking about in a generic type of rock situation. The guitar isn't playing a whole lot of attention to what the drummer and bass player are doing. They just want to feel it groove. Sure. And I want to feel it groove too, but it's more complex than that. So yeah. I need to hear them and they need to hear me. And that has to be in the right kind of environment. So th that kind of environment for us is a nice dry room where there's a carpet would help and some some acoustic material on the walls, not cement and glass, uh, uh, you know, because that is just fucking horrible. Yep. You know, it's yep. very hard to play musical stuff in, in a room like that. It's funny. I, I got a friend... Um, who bought himself a uh, a restaurant theater type arrangement. He did quite well in one of those Australia's Got Talent kind of shows. He was a runner-up in one of those. and um, he, he kept the, running the, the wave of that by starting uh, a restaurant where he had a stage and he was the singing chef. He, I say was, still is. David DeVito is who I'm <laughs> talking about cool. here. Um, and at the end of the night, he gets up after he's cooked all the meals and just jams. He's got, you know, all the, the pianos, guitars. He's a brilliant multi-instrumentalist. Multi um, now, David told me that he, when it came to furnishing the whole place, even the chairs have acoustic properties in that place because mm -hmm. exactly what you were saying, he didn't want this big empty barn where you play a note and all you're hearing is just coming back at you so um yeah it makes a world of difference absolutely yeah it's it's i can't stand playing those kind of rooms where the drummer just barely hits the snare drum and it sounds like a gunshot went mm. off mm. you're actually playing inside a giant sound amplifier and that's what a low concrete ceiling will do for you you know and and i've played enough clubs with low concrete ceilings we will ask to play we will ask to move the equipment up so far that we're almost in the audience.
because we want to get away from that because we yep. know we've experienced it. We know as soon as we see the room, uh-uh, this is going to be one of those. And we yeah. don't, we're going to try everything we can to get away from it. So we might take up the first row of seats to get out from under that, that thing. So it, it, it I, I mean, I've been playing for so long after 40 years on the road, I've played in just about every type of venue and I know what to expect and I kind of know how to fix it. And if we have those situations, sometimes you don't know till you start playing, but I would say 80% of the time I know just from looking at yeah. the room, what it's going to sound like. Yep. Yeah. I'm usually not surprised by the sound. Um, and then we know what to do. Proximity has a lot to do with it because, you know, of course, if it's a if it's a kind of stage where if it's a boomy room, you want to set up as close together as possible so you can hear each other acoustically. But there's also those kind of rooms where you know it's going to be loud, so you want to get some distance from the drums and set up. I want at least five five to seven feet, you know, between me and the drums. Otherwise, I know that. If I hear the drums too loud, it's going to make me because I can always put them in a monitor and fix that later. But if I set up too close to them, I can't fix that. And then I'm going to have I'm going to be playing louder than I wanted to play because I've got a drum attack in my ears. So there's there's fixes for just about every acoustic problem that occurs on the road. Um, there are some things that can't be fixed, like a big boomy room. We have actually a kind of set of material that we play for rooms like that. Oh, really? That are, it's our simplest music. Yep. yep. Because we know that we're not going to play anything in this room that anybody else is going to hear. Uh, we're not, we're going to have a real communication in, in this room because it's just so boomy and so ambient that in order to really hear anything, you'd have to actually have your fingers in your ears like this mm -hmm. to, to get rid of all that ambience. You'd have to, and I can't put my ears, fingers in my ears and play at the same time. And earplugs, man, I have a hard time. They just, they just complete, they just completely destroy the high end for me. Have you tried different so, ones? Uh, have you tried like, I have, I've ones? tried a lot of them and they're really yeah. expensive ones too. Yep. And they make my guitar sound like this. Mm, mm. And I don't know I, how drummers can do it. I've, I've tried jumping on drums with squishy push-in ones. And wow, you're hitting it. There's just nothing. There's just... You know what? I don't allow drummers to wear phones, earplugs. Because that means they're going to play louder than they need to. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you need to wear earplugs, just tell us to turn down. We'll turn down. So you can hear yourself. Yep. We've got knobs on our amps. That's what they're for. We yep. turn it down, yep. you know, because if a drummer's wearing earplugs, then he's going to hear himself a lot less loud than you're hearing him. And that's bad news. It's another thing I won't allow is risers because you put drums up on a riser and that's guaranteed to make the bass drum twice as loud as the rest of the kit. Okay. So, so then you've got like, boom, boom, boom. And that's one of the first things we tell sound men. We are not Judas Priest. So we don't want to be mixed like a rock band, like a like a metal band. Yep. Because I've been to enough metal shows that basically all you hear is the bass drum and the bass guitar. And that's the two loudest things on stage. Yep. And yep. because people don't feel like it's metal unless they're actually feeling it in their stomach. So... That's exactly the opposite sound that we want. We want a natural sound. So we yeah. tell the sound man, because we can't afford to tour with our own sound man, <laughs> which is kind of a drag. Because <laughs> in, the, in the old days, we used to have our own sound man, which was really a luxury. These days, we can't really afford it. So we use the house guy. But we have to really kind, kind of give some of them a lesson in what we want them to sound like. And that's okay, because they're not used to mixing... Um, some kinds of music and we tell them to just walk up on stage and listen to what it sounds like on stage and make it sound like that in the house. That's it. It's nice. all you have to do. Yeah. And I have a friend who's always on the road with us and I will find out what it sounds like. And the sound man will do what they tell them to do. So it's like an extension of me in the audience. Cool. And the sound man has to obey what they say. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and if that person feels like sometimes it's my agent, sometimes it's the road manager or whatever. But if that person feels like it's getting like like he did what we said during sound check, but during the show he went back to mixing the way he thinks it should sound like, he will be fired. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You know. He yeah. has to do what we tell him to do. That's good. And, yeah, and, I, I uh, bet yeah. I bet a lot of guys don't like that. Yeah, you know, get the tap on the shoulder. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, they some of them don't, but actually I've found that most of them don't mind at all because they just want to make the musicians happy. Sure. And and they hear when they start to hear the music, they realize, "Oh, I get it why. I see why they don't want the bass drum to have like 8 dB of 100 hertz on it because his bass drum is way busier. He's not going doo 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 doo. He's going doo 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 way more sophisticated sure. if you give a drum if you give a bass drum like that a bunch of 100 hertz it's just going to be a mess you know so the bass drum has to sound tight and poppy yep and yep. uh because it's more closer to funk than it is to rock yep and so you know the 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 sound man will totally understand that when he hears what the drummer is playing and he's going to go oh duh no wonder they don't want all this low end on the bass drum because it would just be horrible so that's why i say most of them are cool with it they they once they hear us play they see why we want what we want cool now scott i've got a few people asking about gear and i am, am going to come back to your gear because people are saying that your tone is just on another level um but i do have a couple more i don't know <laughs> myself <laughs> can, so folks if you are watching live feel higher, free to ask me feel free to leave some questions uh up now i'll come Back to those yeah, sure, in, in just a sure, second. Sure, yeah. Uh, but I, uh, as you were talking before, you, you you mentioned the magic word for me: motifs. Now, yeah. I on Truefire, um, brilliant learning site. Uh, I saw a, I think it was Larry Carlton doing a um, a video on blues motifs, and just listening mm -hmm. to the rest of the band and picking up on something that somebody played and repeating it in different musical ways and mm -hmm. man I, I gotta say I, I tried that uh, for the first time not after not long after seeing that and my friend who had played 30 odd years uh, in bands with just he stopped playing his bass just threw his hands up in the air and went oh what the fuck was that yes um, so hearing those little nuances that you're talking about not playing too loud so you can hear things that other people are doing and then making motifs from that that's a, that's a big thing Anyone watching and you want to get something out of this, don't play too loud. Listen to the other guys. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, for for jazz musicians and people that play music that's influenced by jazz, I'm not going to call myself a jazz musician. You know, the only reason I don't call my jazz myself a jazz musician is because, you know, most mus jazz musicians are into playing standards and they, they their gigs are basically tunes out of the real book and and they're into playing hollow body jazz guitars and I'm just not that guy, but I am highly influenced by jazz, even though I play with a rock tone and I write my own music. I don't play standards, but still there are those elements of jazz that I, that I totally hold in high reverence. And one of them is playing motifically and telling a story with your solo. Um, too many guys, don't have the self-confidence they need to play motifs because in order to even start to play a motif you have to be somewhat confident about what you play you can't just play an idea and throw it into the trash and then play the next idea and throw that into the trash and play the next idea because essentially what you would have if this was compared to literature is you would have a book with no sentences, no periods, no question marks, no paragraphs, and it would just be text. And it would be very hard, even though all that text is correct, grammatically correct, it would be very hard to hear where one idea stops and another idea begins, and that's why we have paragraphs. So to organize your solos into paragraphs and to play and experience that with other musicians who are doing like-minded um, that's part of storytelling on your instrument, whatever instrument you play. And motifs are a big part of it. To be confident in something that you play, confident enough to play it again, 
on different in different ways. It could be different pitch levels, different shape, uh, a shape that you move around, you know, a rhythmic idea that you move around. And in and when you're playing over changes, it's a little more difficult to do because you need to know where those notes are on the neck to accomplish that. And that's why the study of harmony and the study of it's not for everybody. You know, like I, I would say, if you're going to play over one chord vamps, yeah, you need to learn how to play motifs too because you need to tell a story over that one chord vamp you can't just play a bunch of random bullshit all the time because it's boring but at the same time you don't need to worry about all that chord stuff and learning every single chord tone on the net because you don't plan to play through chord changes but for those people who do that's why they work so hard at it so that they can learn where all those notes are on their neck and not have to think about it. And it's just like learning a language. You learn the words so you can forget about them and just talk. And that's what jazz musicians do. We learn our, we learn where all the harmonic structure is on our guitar so we can get to it very easily without even having to think at all. In fact, it's so far, it's so learned that it's back in our, subconscious like we see the color red and just go oh that's red it's blue there's my mom her her name's G geneva or <laughs> whatever yeah. it's learned that well yeah i mean some of my students they uh they they don't realize how much work is involved when they start that that journey and they think that there's some simple solution to it it's almost like saying i want to be an airline pilot but i don't want to know what all those little knobs do because it's too much work. But I remember when my daughter was six, I could say, Angela, what's the six in the key of E? And she would just go C sharp, daddy, boom, play a C sharp on the piano. Wow. Nothing. Wow. Well, yeah. I mean, any kid can do that because all these kids, when they're six, they learn their multiplication tables. Sure. Music isn't any different from that. It's just 12 times 12. So anybody should be able to learn their key signatures. Um, the hardest thing is... We have a difficult instrument. Guitar is not like a piano. We don't have an octave laid out exactly the same way. A piano has only one middle C. We have five middle Cs on the guitar. So it's five times harder uh, than a piano. So fuck all you keyboard players. <laughs> we, yeah. got a, we got a way more difficult instrument than yours. So yep. it takes us more time to learn where those chord tones are on our instrument than it does on yours. But nevertheless, we can do it. Uh, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Cause I'm a total dumbass. So <laughs> it's funny. Uh, um, yeah, I consider myself to be pretty stupid with a lot of that stuff, but um, <laughs> I'm mentally challenged. <laughs> yeah. Some people just have what I call musical common sense though. And I don't think you can teach that. You know, some people I would have to say are given a natural talent that, others aren't say take somebody like Jacob Collier he's so young but he's so gifted you know those kind of people don't come along very often I'm certainly not one of those people um, I don't think I was born with any more talent than anyone else I just worked hard and still working hard but that doesn't mean that you can't you know be your best and learn and be one of the great musicians if you work really hard it's all about hard work it's all about the more time you spend with the instrument the the better you're going to be at it and that's all it, there that's all there is to it i don't believe that i've seen some of my students that couldn't tap their foot to music and after being hanging around good musicians and being in school for a while they become pretty good rhythmic players and be develop a really good rhythmic vocabulary so i am not one of those people that don't believe those things can be taught because i've seen firsthand that they can be taught to people that have absolutely no concept of time wow. and then they become really strong at it yep. after working on it so i per totally believe in huh? hard work persistence what's that perseverance yeah that's it persistence yeah yep. absolutely. same thing as writing you know like i've just been writing now for six months i can't tell you what it feels like. i feel like i just had a baby <laughs> it's like, man six months in my room just writing for, I don't know, sometimes 12 hours a day, taking breaks, but every day writing and uh, throwing a lot of stuff away 
coming in the next day and going, what the hell was I smoking when I wrote that and throwing it into the trash. And that's, it's hard to look at yourself because you have to face your demons. You have to go like, why, why can't I hear what I want? And eventually you find what you want, but it takes so much time and effort. And that's why I really believe what this one guy said. I can't remember, but he's a famous classical composer from the 1900s. And he said, um, he said, if you're having a good time writing, you're probably writing a piece of shit. <laughs> like, so, okay i can totally relate to that yeah so what sometimes you, it's uh, so frustrating be, what are you going to be doing with all this stuff you've been writing is this just for you guys to take, well, out? take out yeah well the very first thing i've got to do now is i've got to write all the bass charts because that's going to take a little time and then i will send all the music to my guys and they'll learn it and when we have our tour of Europe in March 2022, and we've got a big long tour, like seven weeks of touring, and we'll play all this new music, and I hope to play it on at least two or three tours in 2022, and then hopefully in January 2023, we'll go into the studio and record it, because, you know, the music grows when you play it on stage. It, it becomes organic not too much that anybody writes with a computer is I would call organic. It may be really nice and somebody might hear it and go, Oh, what a cool composition, but it's not going to really develop a human element to it. Um, the bass player being a bass player, which I'm not, he's going to come up with stuff I didn't think of, mm -hmm. especially in the more improvised sections. He's going to come up with his own cool way of doing stuff that I would have never thought of on my own. And likewise for the drummer, I'm not, don't consider myself a, gr a great drum programmer. I just give him the basic beat with some fills and let him take it from there. And he's going to come up with stuff that um, is much more advanced and better and more organic than I could have thought of. And on those improvised sections, when we play those tunes live as a trio, there's going to be things happening from us listening to each other that that develop and i want those on the those are the main things that i want on the record yeah those communication things yep. and you can only get that from playing the music um it's one thing i really regret about the early tribal tech records because when tribal tech first got together we were just a studio band we didn't have an agent we weren't touring we were lucky to play one gig a month so it was sort of like okay write the music have some rehearsals, learn the music, do a gig, and go right into the studio. Yep. So that music sounds very stiff to me. Like it didn't get a chance to blossom sure. because we never toured playing it. Yep. And luckily now that I'm able to go on the road and play the music live, I feel like I can put on the record the tunes at their best, at, at, give them a chance to grow and then record them. So um, I'm lucky to have that opportunity. Awesome. So Scott, uh, so Scott, I wanted to pick your brains uh, just on something. Um, now, I, I do realize that you make a great, uh, one of your biggest sources of income is your teaching. So I'm not going to ask you to give away secrets, um, which don't have to spill too much. But <laughs> No, it's all right. Where do I start? As I said, man, I'm so sick of my own playing. You know, every time I pick up a guitar, I'm just like, yeah, here's those same licks I've been playing. <laughs> hey man, listen. I feel the exact same way about my playing. So don't feel that you're the only guy that feels like that. No matter what level you're on, you have to hear yourself play every day. And, and that's frustrating, you know, and I, I listen to myself play a lot of the same things, though. I know that if, you know, a lot of it has to do with tempo. If I'm playing at a slow to medium tempo, I can be much more creative and I can play stuff that I've never played before. But the faster the tempo, the more I have to rely on stuff that I already know to keep the tempo up. Yeah. And that's where I really get sick of my playing because when I play fast tempos, I, I'm playing the same shit and I'm going, ah, I'm so sick of this. And that's why we're always practicing and learning new things so that we can finally get to the point where we can play new stuff at, at, at higher tempos. You know what? I think you've really hit the nail on the head there because I just got myself a Kemper... Uh, floor unit sitting right beside me here um, mm -hmm. for some upcoming shows. It's just practical for me to have a solution like that. But uh -huh. 
those things are only as good as the profiles that you have in there. And I had thousands of profiles that I sorted through uh, the last couple of days. And last night, I ended up narrowing it down and starting with the lowest gain ones. And I put on Stevie Ray Vaughan record uh, or just one song, uh, Tim Pan Alley, and just that guitar sound is just like, oh, you know, in the yeah, in my it's monitors. Yeah, a nice tone, yeah. It's right there. You can touch it. It's not harsh, but it's got that yeah. sparkle. So I was playing along. He'd play a lick, and I'd play a lick, and I was sort of just going, nah, that one's too bright. Nah, that one's too dull. Just trying to find the profile that was in that ballpark. But I slowed right down, and I was just playing some nice, slow things to complement what was going on. And um, it was less boring than when I'm sitting around going, it's like, oh, man. You know, it's the same well, yeah, Paul Gilbert sure. lick that everyone's been playing since 1986. <laughs> 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 so maybe I just need to slow the fuck down, huh? Well, I, I, I don't know. I haven't heard you play, so I can't really say. But I just know for me that the times where I play the best, my best, is when I'm the most relaxed. And when I'm relaxed, I'm more relaxed at playing medium to slow tempos than when I feel like that I have to really address the chops issue. And when I have to start really playing fast, then it becomes less about improvisation and more about just cutting and pasting things that I know together in different ways to tell a different story. And we're all like that. If you listen to a Coltrane solo, you know, what? his solo that he's famous for the giant step solo he did an alternate giant step solo too i'm not sure where you can find it but there's a john coltrane giant step solo alternate take and it's a completely different solo but if you put a microscope on it you're going to hear a lot of the same small ideas sure. four note to eight note ideas you know one two three five he played that a lot you know da 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 he played a lot of those same licks and ideas because those are a natural part of his vocabulary and everybody has their own vocabulary whether you're a rock player country player jazz player whatever yep so the faster you play the the less you're able to make up new small words and you're just able to use the words that you have and cut and paste them together in different ways. So I like to play when I can actually make up new words and have my fingers do things that they've never done before. I'm not able to do that at fast tempos, and most people aren't. So we rely on what we already know. Okay. And, uh, you know, that's I said that before. I don't mean to reiterate I, and, and, you know, just... But it's just something that people need to know that... If someone counts off a tune really fast, don't expect to just amaze yourself and play some stuff you've never played before because it's very difficult. But if the tempo's slower, you might have an easier time playing stuff that you've never ever played before and thinking of creative ideas that you haven't thought of before because you have the time to do it. Um, that's it. Now, creative ideas, that, that's exactly what I'm... I'm, I'm getting at to, to break out of my standard rock stuff and to bring more of a jazz blues element without giving away too much because uh, I, I will ask you where people can find your educational stuff online as well as how they can get in touch with you for, for lessons. But where do I start, man? Where do I start? Well, I would say, I would say to anybody, and this really doesn't have much to do with any secret teaching stuff. It's just, and there really aren't any secrets anyway. Everybody just passes this information to everybody else. But transcription is a very big part of learning. And in order to, it's just basically learning to put your fingers in on the guitar in a way that you wouldn't have thought of by yourself. So one of the things that I hear people say is, oh, you shouldn't transcribe. You don't want to just play other people's licks. To me, transcribing is not about playing other people's licks. That is just the very tip of the iceberg. It may be like that when you first start doing, like say you want to learn a John Schofield lick. Well, chances are if you learn a John Schofield lick, everybody's going to know where you got it, which is bad. Because he's got such a definitive style that as soon as you learn one of his licks and you play it on stage, everybody's going to go, John Schofield. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So, yep. so. You know, there's only so far you can take that. But 
on the other side of it, if you take that lick and you learn it, maybe it's only just a very small, short line. Because the longer you learn lines, the longer lines you learn, the less you're going to use them. You know, if you if you learn the sentence, I left my coat at the bank, you can't use that sentence unless you unless you leave your coat at the bank. Sure. Right. Sure. So you learn some big, long line over a set of chord changes. You're never going to use that line unless you're playing those exact same chord changes. And it's going to feel like a classical exercise more than improvisation. So the idea is to learn a lot of short ideas, short four to eight notes at the most, and then cut and paste those ideas around and just like we do with words you yep. learn a word you learn how to use it in a sentence and when we talk we're using the same words over and over and over but we're rearranging them and telling our story with those same words so it's just like a language it's no different so when you transcribe a word you don't necessarily have to pronounce it the exact way the guy that you learned it from did okay. you can change its rhythm you can change its mode. Like if you learn a lick in C major, the, the guy played it as a C major idea. Well, that can also be a D minor idea, or it could be an E Phrygian idea. You know, it could be any one of the modes, and that goes for melodic minor as well. If you learn something like, say, as a dominant, like, say, Lydian dominant idea, it could also, also be used as an altered idea over an altered dominant. It would just be playing that melodic minor scale in a different place. So um, you can change the rhythm of it. You can play it in eighth notes. You could play it in triplets. You could play it in sixteenths. You could start it on a different beat. You could only play a section of it or a little piece of it. There's so many things you could do to permutate that little. Is permutate a word? <laughs> permutate, I meant. Permeate. <laughs> I told you I was a dumbass. Well, yeah, no, um, no, no. No, we're talking about making up making up words, new vocabulary. There you yeah, go. There's there a I new did. Totally I just did it. Right. Communitate. Yeah. So, so, you know, somehow you can morph, that's an easier word. You can morph that idea into being you instead of the person you learned it from. And if you transcribe a bunch of those new things, if you learned, imagine if you learned a new idea every week, at the end of a year, you'd have 52 new ideas. That's a lot. Yeah. You know, if somebody saw you play a year later, they would go, holy shit, this guy's got a lot of new shit he's playing. You know, it's it's important. Yep. And transcription is a very big part of the learning process. So that's where I would tell you to go. The first place to go is to your record collection. I We have to tell our students at school, if you think the school is going to teach you how to be a good player, you are very mistaken because we can tell you things, theory things, stuff like that. We can name scales for you and tell you what this is or that is, but your teachers are your CD collection. Those are, we've got a lot of good teachers in, at MI, but I, we, sorry, we don't have anybody that plays as good as John Coltrane. So I would get your John Coltrane album and learn from him rather than somebody, some doofus like me. Man, that, <laughs> you know? that is, that's so, some priceless advice. That's some priceless advice. <laughs> so, and, so, yeah, yeah. It's, it's learning by ear is very important. I'm, I'm not a really big, unless you're like a brilliant reader, I'm, I'm a pretty terrible reader, so I don't really never got into it that much. But I feel like things stick with you more when you learn them by ear. When you just sit there and transcribe it off out of your speaker and learn it on your guitar, I feel like you somehow it it integrates into your soul in a deeper way than when you get it off a of page. Yeah, and it's kind of a cold way to get it. I like to get it from the speaker. I like to be inspired. Like I'm listening to something and someone plays something, and I go, "What the fuck was that? I want to know that." Yeah, and then I just put it in my you know, transfer it into my DAW and just play it. If it's ridiculously fast, I might slow it down a little bit or whatever. Now you've got that amazing slow downer that makes it really easy to transcribe. Do you use anything like if that? If it's fast. No, I don't. I just I just do it a couple notes at a time. If it's really fast, yeah. I do like to put it in a DAW because learning something from iTunes is a pain in the ass because 
if you hit the backwards button, it goes back like 15 minutes yeah. or, or goes to the next, the previous song or some shit like that. If I put it in my DAW, I can hit the re- re- reverse button at a very slow pace and go back like four notes. Yep. And no matter how fast it is, I can just take it back and just, okay, I got those two notes. Now let me get the next two notes. I got the next two notes. And then until I've got the phrase. Awesome. I use something so, called Transcribe. It's a, a particular yeah, piece of software. Yeah, I know software. that program. A lot oh, of my students use it and it's great. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, and there's some hidden things in that. Like I started using that. I was playing in a Queen tribute show a few years back. Um, <laughs> that sounds cool. Oh, it was. It was. Um, uh, I love then, Queen. I, I got, I got you, a, know, a, you know, Brian May is a fan of mine. I'm really like proud of that. Awesome. I played at Ronnie Scott's and he told a bunch of his friends to come see me at Ronnie Scott's oh, and they all came to me and they say, Brian May told us to come see you. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. Wow. Wow. So I've got a little, <laughs> I'm a big queen fan. I got a little, um, thing up behind me there. Uh, the, the wig on, on, on my pretend bucket head up there, uh, was my wig from the show. And I, um, I'm exactly the same height as Brian May, and I, I lost some weight to get exactly the, the same weight as him and everything when I was doing the show. And our, our Freddie looked exactly like Freddie Mercury. In fact, there was oh, cool. not, not the big movie that came out, but there was one like more of a, a documentary movie that came out before that, and he, he played the part in there. Um, can't sing like him to save his life, but people listen with their, with their eyes. And we'd walk out on stage, and people would just lose their shit. Because everyone in the band looked like their counterpart in Queen. That's so cool. But um, what I was getting to was I started using that software then to really get into the parts he was playing. And then when you put something on repeat and you start slow and each repeat gets faster and faster and you're copying the vibrato and everything. People said to me, the sound guy actually after I left, he said, man, they've got... They've had three other guitar players since you, and none of them have got the feel of Brian. You just nailed the feel. And I, was, and I said, it's because I was learning it slow and I was copying his vibrato exact. And by the time I got it to tempo, man, you got those bends and everything exactly on it. And uh, I use that software still now. I'm, I've got a show coming up really soon with um, singers from a whole bunch of Australian 80s bands. Um, and learning the parts using Transcribe, I'm able to... Um, just listen to the left channel, just listen to the right channel, listen to yeah. it in mono, but with the, the phase flipped on each side so that it cancels out anything mm-hmm. in the middle. And you start hearing these parts that you had no idea were there, were there or notes that you didn't know were there. So the, the that's a great program. Any, any, any helpful tool like that is highly recommended, you know, cause it's, it's, there's so much in certain cases, like say Brian May, but I would also mention blues because so much about blues players isn't so much about the notes that they play, but it's about the timing of the notes and about the tone and the phrasing and the bending, the vibrato. And when students are transcribing blues players, it's not enough just to get the notes. That's just the very, very beginning starting point. You've got to actually get the vibe. You've got to sound like that. You've got to you've got to wonder where is he picking the string to get that tone, or maybe he's using his finger to pop the string. Or how's he getting that vibrato? Is it a finger vibrato? Is it a hand vibrato? How short is that note? And is it right on the time grid, or is it a little bit late or early? You know those those kind of nuances are what blues is all about. So for a guy to study blues and only care about the notes, they're not really studying blues at all. Yeah. So what you're talking about, having a tool like Transcribe or the Amazing Slow Downer can be very helpful in, you know, transcription. But the, the main point I wanted to get across is that transcription is really, really important. And just, if anything, with nothing else but inspiration. Because it helps to inspire you. Like, I can't understand how anybody can say my playing is in a rut with all these thousands of brilliant guitar players running around with their amazing vocabularies that you can't steal from some of those guys. Because that's one thing John Schofield said in a, in a famous interview of his is that steal from everybody. That's how you learn how to play your instrument. Steal from everybody. Don't just steal from one guy because then you're going to sound too much like him. You're going to be a clone and no one's ever going to hire you. But 
But what was that really great saying? If you steal from one guy, it's plagiarism. If you steal from everybody, it's research. Nice. That's how you got to think about it. Nice. So. <laughs> Scott, I, I'm going to start going through some of the questions there, mate. Um, yeah, sure. Now, um, Sean Pierce Johnson is watching, and Sean's actually a great YouTuber. I love his channel myself. Um, and Sean, right at the start, said, this is what I came here to hear. Scott's tone is just on another level. So I'm well, going to th preempt. Thanks, man. That's a big compliment. Thank you. I'm going to preempt uh, any more questions about your tone by just asking you about your signal chain, mate. You, you start with that beautiful Sir guitar of yours. Is that a, is that a Scott Henderson it's, model guitar? Yeah, it is. And it's actually cl the closest thing to a vintage Strat that they make because it's an alder body, light alder. That's what the Strats were made out of in the 50s and 60s. It's a roasted maple neck with a rosewood board, which is, you know, same thing, Stevie... Stevie Ray Vaughan's guitar would sound like now because by now the maple has hardened to the point where there's no moisture in it at all. And that's one of the reasons they take the moisture out of the neck because not only does it make it sound deeper, it helps it become more stable so it doesn't bend in the... You have less of a seasonal effect on it bending and warping and having to adjust it and stuff like that. And um, the one thing that makes it a little hipper than a strat is that it's not as difficult to play because to me the stratocaster radius has always been a pain in the ass that's why guys like ingve and richie blackmore scallop their necks because it's very hard to do massive bending with those tiny little fender frets so rather than put big frets on the neck they just scallop the the wood and made the frets bigger and make it easier to play um, so the Sur has jumbo frets, the same frets that are on a Les Paul on my model. And uh, so you don't need to scallop it. It's very easy. to. It's like plays so easy, just like a Les Paul does. It's very easy to get your finger under the strings. And what radius do you get? And uh, I, I think it's 16. I, I, um, Fairly flat. And, and the, flat. yeah, it's pretty flat. And, and the, the neck shape is a D shape. So it's. The typical Stratocaster, I believe, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's a C shape. You've got more wood in the back and less wood on the sides. Mine has a little more wood on the sides and a little less in the back. So that's why D instead of C. Yeah. Right? It makes sense. Yep. Uh, so it's very easy to play neck. There's no gloss on it. Like, I don't know if it's, so your hands, it's like a pool cue, you know, very slippery and slidey and very easy to get from the top of the neck to the bottom. And um, what else about it? Well, the pickups are John's very, very close to the pickups that they made in the 50s and 60s. You can either get V60 LPs, which sound very close to the Stevie Ray Vaughn sound. It's that really kind of scooped, chimey Fender pickup sound. Or the pickups I use, which are Mike Landau pickups. And those are the pickups from his, they're clones of the pickups from a 66 Strat that he owns. And those have a little bit more winding. So they uh, have a little bit more mid-range. They're a little thicker sounding. And I find them to be better for live. But when I record, I use both. I have some guitars with V60s and some with MLs, and I love them both. I, I, I don't know what makes me decide to use one or the other. I just think, well, I used MLs on the last song. <laughs> This uh, this one I'm going to use V6. It's, it's kind of like random. And do you have um, locking tuners or anything like that? Yeah, the tuners are Sir locking tuners. That and and one really beautiful thing about the Sir guitar is that they do a lot of work on the. It has a regular Fender vintage bridge on it, but they do a lot of work on it. They've drilled the hole bigger, and they've put a bigger arm on it. And when I say bigger, I mean thicker, so it will not break. And it's also shorter because some of the fancier, uh, for lack of a better guy, Jeff Beck, you know, those things he does with harmonics where he'll bend those in tune. I don't do a whole lot of that because I don't want to really copy Jeff. But, but a lot of that stuff that Jeff does with the vibrato bar where he's bending those notes really in tune, you couldn't do that with a long arm because you would totally overshoot those okay. notes. The shorter the arm and the harder it is to push down, the more accurate you can be when you're trying to get those notes to be in tune. 
The Jeff Jeff's bar, I think, is only like this. It's really short. Yeah, really. mine is. I think my vibrato bar has about an inch and a half cut off. And the way to tell where my bar is is that if you twirl the bar around and put it over the pickups, the end of the bar or the end of the tip will go over the pull piece on the D string on the middle pickup. So that's where the tip of the bar is. The D string pole of the middle pickup, that's where the end, the tip of the bar will end if you swirl it around and look at it from the top. Most bars will go way past that. Yeah, okay. Because they're they're much longer. Yep, yep, yeah. I think that's approximately about an inch and a half shorter. Yep, that's about an inch longer on that one. And, so and believe me, I have calluses is... on my, I have calluses here to prove how hard the, the damn bar is to push down because, man, it's hard as hell. And uh, it also allows you to rest your hand on the bar without putting the guitar out of tune because cool. I can rest the weight of my guitar and it's so hard to push down that even the weight of my hand won't phase the tuning. So it's a bitch to push that thing down. Yeah, right. So anyway, about the guitar, that's why it's... um you know the closest thing they make to a vintage i don't believe they sell a guitar with a finter vintage six screw bridge that isn't a scott henderson model unless you request it you know like to have that because most of the bridges these days are two post bridges yeah now i generally Those go have for a little six different screw tone i go for six screw mm-hmm. um and I-, I have one guitar with a two post bridge on and it sounds okay but it's a different sound it's not a vintage fender sound yeah. but it's a nice sound but it's not vintage this friedman i keep grabbing here that's probably my only guitar bar the ones with a floyd rose that have a two post and i've always mm-hmm. been of the the mindset that i mean that's just pivoting on a couple of bits of steel as opposed to being resting on the body transferring yeah the, the tone true yeah true is that what you're thinking that's why well yes it and that is in fact what's going on and what you'll notice about a two post bridge is it's more scooped it's more scoop sound you get a little more bass and treble but that big fat mid-range is not there like it is on a six screw bridge because of the transference you know and if you really want to hear what a strat can sound like get one without a bridge on it get one with a a fixed uh, bridge what do you call those fixed bridge yeah, where tail. the strings just go through the body and there's no block or there's no floating tremolo and uh, that is the biggest sounding strat you've ever heard because you're losing a lot of tone because of the vibrato system but it's so much fun to have i don't i'll I, i'm willing to compromise it is <laughs> so it is. is richie blackmore and jeff beck so yeah. if they can compromise now, I, can. I did see somebody asked in the questions uh and i don't want to stray too much from talking about your gear just yet but somebody asked about uh any of your tips on keeping uh, a tremolo in tune so i might come back to that but well that's i can answer that that's one of the things that sir does to the bar and i don't mind telling you because you can do it yourself if you've got if you're not afraid to uh mess around with it but one of the things that they do one of the main reasons that six bridges don't stay in tune is because the hole in the plate are too small so what they'll do is at sir they'll get that same drill bit that goes perfectly into that hole the six holes Mm -hmm. and they'll just slightly get a little bit you know a little bit of play like just rotate it the slightest bit or they'll just get the next big 16th size and make the drill the hole just the slightest bit bigger and of course after you drill it it's going to be nasty so you have to get in there with a file and smooth out all the edges with um what do they call that? A Dremel? Yeah. A Dremel. Yeah. 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 Because it's, it's like a whirling thing on a drill that makes metal edges smooth. So there's a lot of work involved. Okay. Yep. But after all that work is done, what you end up with is a strat, a strat plate with six slightly bigger holes. And that's what it needs to stay in tune. Okay. And also, another tip is that you don't want the four inside screws to touch the plate. So when you put the bridge on the body, like say you have no strings on the guitar, and you rest the, the, the bridge on the body, just lay it on there, and you put the end screws in until the bottom of the screw heads touch the plate. Barely touch the plate. Not make it move. Yeah. Barely touch it. 
right? Then you put in all the other screws about a 16th inch higher. So they never touch the plate, maybe even an eighth inch. higher. They don't touch that plate for no way because now you've made it into a two post bridge in a way that it stabilizes. Uh -huh. Because if those end screws touch the plate, it's never going to stay in tune. Yeah. So that's another thing that they do. And one thing that they do, um, not for the tuning stability, but for the tone, is Fender in all their amazing stupidity have decided to powder coat the blocks of their current Fender bridges. That... <laughs> Don't get me started on Fender. Um, that is the stupidest fucking thing. I've ever seen anyone do in my life. And I don't know who at Fender came up with that brilliant idea, but the reason they do it is so the block won't rust, like rust would ever kill anybody. Um, if you look at the vintage guitars, they have rust all over them and they sound great. Yeah. What powder coating does just completely ruin the tone because not only does the block not vibrate like it should, but they even powder coat the part of the block that attaches to the plate. So what you got to do is you can do it two ways. You can either just drop the pot, drop the block into some paint thinner for two or three days and get it off. But what I do is I just get out my drill and I get one of those nylon rings. That's a paint remover ring. Yep. And I put the block in a vice and I just sand it off. Yeah. Sand all that yeah. stupid paint off the block until it's really shiny. It's almost like a mirror steel shine. Yeah, you can right. totally tell when you got rid of it. Because yep. because it goes from being gray to being really super shiny. And then you put it back on the bridge and then your guitar sounds like it's supposed to. Okay. That's why Fender guitars sound like shit because they yeah. they okay. powder coat the block. Yeah. Hey, Scott, um, hey, Scott um, we're getting an occasional little glitch. I'm still hearing everything you're saying. Can you do okay. me a favor? Can you log out and log back in just quickly and just see if that fixes that? Yes. Yeah, okay, thanks, mate. Yeah. I'll just talk to the people in the meantime. So, people, I'm not sure if you were getting that on, on your end, but it was enough just, it was a little bit annoying, so I'm getting Scott to log out and log back in. But please, uh, question time, leave some questions, we'll, we'll get through all those. I don't want to keep him too long. Um, and let's see, there he is. Is that any better? It. Yeah, it seems better, better already. Okay. Okay. So, um, we're talking the, the guitar. Um do you have now? Everyone overlooks the strap. Let me just change my view here so we can see both of us. Um, man, I I I did a promo video for a band recently, and it was a really cool band. I had an Elvis impersonator fronting a hard rock band. Um, yeah, yeah, and they okay. So they did they did Black Sabbath Paranoid, but lyrically Elvis was singing "Hunk a Hunk of Burning Love" over the top of that, and it just awesome. it just works, man. But yeah, I the guitar imagine. player, speaking of Fender, had this Fender clip lock system on his guitar strap. And it would just come off every minute or so. And it got to the point where we'd just have to stop filming. And I just, just, just had to say to him, dude, whatever that strap lock system you've got going on there, fuck it off now, man. That just does not work. And we huh. took it off and then his guitar didn't come off anymore. Do you have any type of strap locks or anything that you I use shower cl clip locks shower yep they never come off i don't know i i think i think there might be some kind of um locks for straps that attach from the top i've seen them mine don't mine aren't like that mine are wedges that, let me show you um okay, okay. Show you. i'm gonna grab mine while you grab that, while you grab that. yeah um Yeah, on the strap end, it looks like this. Yep. Yep. And, I know and the ones. See, I used it, to use it, those. It, it can't come off because gravity is it's coming into the thing. And how can it possibly come off? Because it's gravity keeps it there. I'll tell you how it can come off. That damn nut on the other side has come off on me. Oh, if it's oh, you know what? I tighten these so tight that I think I'm going to break it, man. And, and I've never had one come loose. 
I, have, I just I, tighten the I, shit my, out of it. Oh, beautiful Valley Arts guitar that I was playing in the 90s had a nice chip in the bottom of it from where that came off. I remember where I was. I was playing a gig oh, great. in Mount Isa and jumping around and psh, off she came. I use these, which are Locket. I don't have anything going with the company, uh-huh. so it's not a paid endorsement. Oh, but, okay. Um, it's got a built-in... I yeah, I see. Eyes. I'm sure that works good too. I mean, I I've never had a problem with mine. Maybe it's just because people uh, people aren't tightening that nut tight enough. I think that was the case, or it came un- undone. Yeah, because I get a, I get like an adjustable wrench, and I like hammer that thing so tight, it's never going to come loose. So yeah, right. so that that might be my secret. <laughs> Maybe I just need to work on my wrist mm. strength to be able to tighten those. Yeah, up that's, better. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that never. You need to go again. to the gym, man, and get those wrists <laughs> strengthened up. <laughs> okay, so from guitar, we've talked about your, your strap, strap locks. You're a cable kind of guy. No wireless for you. Cable. I don't use anything. Megami twenty twenty five twenty four. That's that's my go to cable for every single cable in anything that I use. It's it's uh i just i won't use anything else what would you say that was like good because else. you said megami what was the model number 2524 2524 yeah. i only asked because um i do have a cable sponsor for the show um and i just want to compare specs to the summer cable that i use um i'll look up the 2524 i wouldn't know what the specs of the cable are you could look it up on the web but um i don't know the cable cable specs but um, cause to me, it just looks like normal guitar cable, but it sure doesn't sound anything like a lot of cable I've heard. Um, cable is so important. Um, and it really makes a difference. So you can try different kinds and, and, and find what you like, but a lot of those cable com- companies are just as crooked as televangelists because they, they, they hook you into believing taking mid range out of a cable. Like they make a really expensive cable with a silver core and they charge a hundred bucks for it. And all that silver core is doing is taking away all the capacitance out of the cable. And it's making it fooling you into making it think your guitar sounds bigger when you're playing in your room because there's no mid range. Sure. You know, but as soon as you get on stage and the guitar doesn't cut it all through the band and it sounds thin as shit, you're going, Jesus, this cable is fucking awful. And I paid a hundred dollars for it. It's almost like using wireless system. That's why people don't like wireless systems because there's no capacitance. So if you use a cable with no capacitance, you basically have no mid range and guitar is a mid-range instrument so getting rid, rid of the mid-range is about the worst thing you could possibly do sure uh yeah. so that's why i don't use any of that fancy bullshit silver core you know it's yep. like you know uh, uh, i might as well become born again christian if i'm gonna use that shit sorry <laughs> no offense but you know <laughs> and i'm like <laughs> i'm not a religious guy me either, anyway, me, so, me either. so anyway um um, and also speaker cable makes a big difference too. Uh, one of the things, one of, one of the, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell any secrets here, but I'm on the verge of a tremendous IR discovery. And, um, I can't tell you who's involved in it with me, but pretty soon we're going to be putting out some of the most advanced, realistic sounding IRs that have ever, ever, ever been made. Ooh, and, nice. and, um, that's coming soon. Man, I, and, I, I um, love using IRs. Um, yeah. As well, when you hear these, you're going to forget about what you've been using. <laughs> I've heard them all. Yeah. And yep. and I've heard them compared to the real deal. Yep. And they're yep. still not there. But but you will be soon. And and uh, when you hear these, you're going to go, oh, wow. These sound... You're not going to be able to hear the difference wow. between a mic cabinet. One of the reasons that um, IR manufacturers are doing such a piss poor job is because they're not sampling good cabinets. So it's not really the IR technology that's wrong. It's the actual cabinet itself that they're trying to capture. It's not a good sounding cabinet. 
So if you don't have a good sounding cabinet, you're not going to have a good sounding IR. So um, there are a lot of mistakes that people make, like wiring your cabinet with really thin cable. There's no point in using like a 10 gauge speaker cable from your amp to your cabinet if you're going to lose that 10 gauge speaker cable by wiring your amp, wiring your cabinet with wire from a television set. Sure. You've lost all that. You've lost the connection to your speakers from the amp because yep. of the wire. So what I do and what most pros do is they'll take a 10 gauge speaker cable, which usually comes like in a positive negative, sort of like a flat cable with mm -hmm. a crease down the middle. Yep. And they'll pull that cable apart to make two small, you know, two cables. And that's what they wire their cabinets with. I guarantee you there's no IR maker that's doing that. Yeah, right. Okay. So, uh, and, and uh, of course, other things are mic placements. Um, some of the mic placements these companies use, I have just no clue why they're doing it. I just don't get it. And some of the microphones they're using, I don't get either. Because you'll buy, a, you'll buy an IR pack with microphones that no engineer in his right mind would ever put on a guitar cabinet. Yep, yep. Do you go with the, so, the standard 57, 121? I'm a 57 guy. I'm, I don't mix mics. Yep. Yeah. Um, I play through a, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do because a lot of country players use a mix of 57 and a 121 because they're using combos. So when you're using a combo amp, you're losing a lot of bass because it's an open back cabinet. So you need that 121 in there to help bring some of the bass that you've lost because you're playing through a combo amp. I play through a 4x12 most of the time, so the last thing I need is more bass. I've got more bass than I need. So uh, for me, a 57 is all I need. I don't really need the 121 or anything to produce more bass because it's just overkill. Well, I was going to ask you but about I can that cabinet. See, I can we've, see, yeah. I was going to ask you about that cabinet, but we've got a whole bunch of other stuff between uh, the cable and that cabinet. I'm sure we'll get to that in a second. Where do you go to from cable? Well, I mean, I, I like to keep my recording thing really, really simple. So it's just basically a guitar into a pedal, into an amp, into the speaker cabinet. That's it. It's not, it's not like I would never go through, like, say, a pedal board with a buffer or something like that. I am completely against buffers. I hate the sound of them. Oh, really? Okay, um, yep. yep. Yeah, I, I hate them. Um, I mean, there are some that are better than others, but I've never heard one I like. Um, that's why I, I have such a small pedal board live because you can't really get away with using more than five or so true bypass pedals before you start losing tone. And if you start getting over that number, then you have to use a buffer and a pedal board that loops those pedals in, you know, the pedals stay on all the time and you loop them in and the yep. buffer is always on. Yep. But that buffer creates a big problem, man, because the buffer is not, a buffer is not what Jimi Hendrix <laughs> did. Sure, sure. <laughs> You're not going to sound like Hendrix using a buffer. So, Scott, and I'm going to ask you uh, about your small yeah. pedal board that you are using. And I said to you before that there might be a time where I'd, I do this and just run off next door. So please tell us about your pedal board and I will be back in 30 seconds. Yeah. Well, my pedal board is really simple. It's just got like a few, um, it's got a few different distortion pedals because I like to have different amounts of gain. So there's the first pedal I go to is an RC booster because it's like, for me, it's, I mean, there's a lot of great boosters out there, but for me, that one is the most transparent one that I've heard. And it also has two channels, so I can use the clean channel if I want very clean chords. And if I hit the second channel, it gives me a little more gain enough to play solos. And the next pedal I go to is an Octavia, which is, you know, pedal that Hendrix is made famous. Um, then I go into an SD9, which is, a very sort of uh, common distortion pedal that a lot of guys use. I know Mike Landau uses it. One of the reasons I like it is because it's equally nice on both the treble and the, the I mean, the bridge and the neck pickup, whereas a lot of distortion pedals, they're very fat sounding on the treble pickup or the bridge pickup, but on the neck pickup, they sound really woofy and vice versa can sound really nice on the neck pickup but very thin on the treble pickup the thing i love about the sd9 is it sounds pretty nice on both and works pretty good on both and it's got a lot of compression so it's good for legato playing if you don't want to pick too much and if you want to do a lot of hammer-ons and pull-offs 
it's a good pedal for that. So that's on my board. And also a chorus. And I love the um, Zvex fuzz face because it's a great noise maker when I need to make some noise and just freak people out. And then a wah, and that's it. Small, small, easy setup. And then from there, you said you go to a, uh, a 71 Marshall, yeah? Yeah. Um, or my Sir SH100, which is basically the same amp. Um, and what is that, then I have, or? it's, uh, well, they didn't really call them that back then. Um, they called them super lead in the sixties, super bass. I'm not actually sure which one mine is. It could be either one, but it was modified by John with this extra tube and, and master volume. That really helps me a lot because I don't, you know, I'm not playing stadiums. I'm playing smaller rooms, theaters, and clubs. So I don't want to be ridiculously loud. But, um, yeah, and then I use a wet-dry rig. So I, I go out of an extra output of a speaker output into a little line box, which is just the size of a very small pedal. And it feeds my multi-effects, which is just like a whatever I happen to be using. I, I use different things sometimes, but I usually use a Boss SE70 because it's small. And um, that's got all kinds of stuff in it. Reverb, delay, whatever I need. It's got pitch transposing or what, anything. I mainly just use it for reverb and delay. Yeah. And then that goes out into a little Fender Deluxe HRD. And, and since the reverb sound is only like 10% or at the most 20% of your sound, all you need is a little 40 watt combo, 40 watt combo to, to handle that job. Yep. So I remember the days when if you wanted to have a, a, a wet dry rig, you know, people were carrying around these big mixers and a power amp and satellite stereo speakers. And I'm going, oh, man, that's so much trouble. Nowadays, all you need is two things. You need a little box, little pedal and a Fender Hot Rod Deluxe and you're yeah. done. Yeah. And yeah. you can have a wet dry rig and it sounds so much better. Oh my God. Cause first of all, amps do not like having things in the effects loop. They hate it. It, it weighs the amp down. It, 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 it just, it just makes the amp so much less responsive and uh, it doesn't like it. And also when you, the guitar has this kind of natural, feedback with the speaker this natural communication with the speaker with the dry sound when you add reverb and delay in the same speaker it kind of it kind of stifles that communication okay i find i find that when you just you using a dry amp notes feed back really easily like i can just play any note and it'll just feed back and then go up an octave and feed back and just do anything i want it to that didn't used to happen when I had reverb and delay in the same speaker. Okay. Yep. So by putting the reverb and delay only, like my effects unit is set to 100% wet. So the only thing in that little combo amp is reverb and delay by itself. Okay. okay. And, and then, you know, when you get about three feet away from it, you really can't tell that the reverb and dry are coming from two different places. Once you get three or four feet away, it all sounds like it's just coming from one place. Wow. Okay. So 100 percent wet. That's, that, that's I've never thought yeah. about running it that way. Yeah, a lot of guys do it. In fact, most guys I know do it. But I I live here in L.A. where everybody is all about tone. It's yeah. like you yeah. know these. You never met a group. L.A. guitarists are the biggest tone nerds yeah. in the world. I always so, assumed so, when I saw a wet dry wet rig that the outer wet cabs were just this the a blend of. Um, no, 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 completely 100% okay. wet. Yeah. It's like dry coming from the middle. Yep. And then if you're going through a stereo effect, you'd have a stereo reverb, but it would be only the reverb in those satellite left and right speakers. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's just that. like when you mix, it's just like when you mix, you yep. know, you add the effects yep. through the board or whatever. When you mix, you, you record your guitar dry and you add your reverb in later in later and that reverb and delay that you're adding doesn't have any dry signal in it. It's pure reverb and delay, 100%. Yeah, right. yeah, it's the same I'm, thing. I'm same exact concept. I'm going to have to try that. Mm -hmm. to try that. You'll like it. 
You'll like it. Believe me, you'll never go back. Well, I've got two Marshall boxes sitting right here and a Camla cabinet in the in the middle. Do, do you know a guitar player named Louis Shelton from LA from many years ago? I, I've heard the name, I think. Yeah. And, like session guy um, started with the monkeys um, last train to Clarksville. That's him at the intro. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. That's him. Wow. Uh, yeah. Through to Jackson five, Boz Skaggs, um, guitar solo and Lionel Richie's hello. Um, Louis is a good friend of mine, just lives around the corner. And I've got a cool. cabinet here of his, a Camilla cabinet, which is this awesome cabinet, which has this bracing that attaches from the magnet on the back to mm-hmm. the actual cabinet. And man, that's a one by 12. And that's got as much low end as, as a four by 12. Is it um, closed back? Open. Oh, I'm surprised because, you know, usually open back cabinets don't have that much base, but you never know, man. The design of every cabinet's different. Dude, and this you thing never know shakes what to the expect. ground. Like, like that's, I say, it's got this cool. thing called a tunator, which attaches. Oh, well, that's, it's different. It attaches to the, the magnet yeah. on the back. It's surrounded by this thing that, that grips it and then has mm-hmm. braces that attaches the magnet to the actual cabinet. And it, oh, well, yeah, that's a whole different, me, that's a different concept. Yeah, it that's is. That's cool. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to try running that in the center as a, as a, a dry signal and having the two marshals. Yeah. You're just, going to love it. I, I discovered it by accident in Moscow. I was doing a gig with um, the great drummer, Lenny White. Boy, I love that guy's playing. And Jeff Berlin on bass. And they lost my pedal suitcase. Thank you, Aeroflot. <laughs> so, um, so I end up at the gig and I don't have any effects. You know, so luckily somebody there had an RC booster. So I had a pedal at least. And um, I used that pedal and I used my amp dry. And I said, just give me a little bit of reverb and delay in my monitor. So I was hearing reverb and delay coming from the front and the amp from the back, but I had a great playing night that night and my amp just seemed to be playing like butter. And it was the usual Marshall that I rent when I don't have my own gear. I rent, I usually rent like a, what are those JCM 2000 DSL 100. That's the amp I usually rent when I can't bring my own gear when I'm on a flying gig. And for some reason that night, the amp sounded so much better and was so much easier to play. It was like butter. And I said, duh, I don't have anything in the effects loop. So as soon as I got back home, I, I recreated that thing. Nothing in the effects loop, the reverb and delay coming from somewhere else, same exact scenario. The amp just came to life, played so much better, so much. It's like... It feels like I don't even need my right hand. I can just tap the notes on the neck and they just pop right out. Wow. So for me, somebody who plays mostly legato, like I've always been the shittiest picker in the whole world. Yeah. Like any one of my students can pick faster than me. Believe me, I'm telling (laughs) you, my lamest student can pick faster than me. And so I play mostly, you know, with my left hand. It's how I, that's where my chops are in my left hand. So, uh, this wet dry rig has made it so much easier for me to play legato style um, because the notes just pop out better. So gonna believe me, you're going to notice it. And when you try it, yeah, you're going to yeah. like it. Yeah. I'm sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But just getting through the questions, Brendan Coleman. Hey, Brendan um, said, hi, Rick. I wanted to ask Scott with all his years and countless hours of playing, has he suffered any injuries or problems like tendonitis or carpal t- tunnel? Any advice no, luckily, on avoiding these? I, uh, the only advice I give my students sometimes is I've seen some of them have some really bad practicing habits, like when they lean over and they really mess up their backs by leaning over like this for long periods of time. You shouldn't do that. you got to keep a good posture when you're playing because any doctor will tell you that if you're leaning over and curving your spine while you're doing something, you're going to have problems. And those problems can be actually in your back or they can spread out to your arms and hands. So I've seen quite a few students mess themselves up by doing that and practicing for too many hours without giving themselves a break. Sure. And one little bit of information I'd like to share with people that it's really true. Um, you know, doctors have science has proven that the brain only really works at its peak capacity for about a half an hour and then it shuts down. So you're better off practicing a really intense one half hour practice session 
and then taking a 15 minute break and get something to eat or just hang and relax and going back and doing another really intense half hour practicing session, you will remember more and retain that stuff that you're practicing better than if you sit there and practice without taking a break. And that's a medical science thing. I'm not making that up. Doctors have proven that your brain kind of just <laughs> it kind of just like disintegrates after a, a half hour of intense thinking. It just it stops working. Yeah. You got to give it a break. So yeah. that's uh, it's a real it's helped me. You know, when I that's how I practice and uh, and I, I practice for a half an hour. I just go get something to eat, watch some TV. I come back and practice for another hour half hour and do that for as many times as I want. But I, I try not to allow myself to sit there and just go and go and go and go because I get foggy and I just go like, I just can't even remember the last thing I just played. My yeah. brain turns to mush. Yep. Yep. And it's a, uh, it's a thing. Uh, Bernie wants to know string gauge. We didn't ask, I didn't ask you what string. I use string tens. Gauge. Tens. Yep. I use tens. Yeah. Um, Nines, nines sound, can sound a little bit thin with single coils, though they usually sound great with humbuckers. But with single coils, nines start to get a little bit on the thin side. And um, when I was doing those blue al blues albums like Dog Party and Tour Down House, I was using 11s tuned down to E flat because my fingers aren't strong enough. I don't know how some of these guys do it, like Josh Smith, Steve Ray Vaughan. These guys were playing 12s tuned to E. And I heard that Stevie Ray Vaughan in the studio was using 13s tuned to E. And I'm going like, my fingers would just break off. Yeah, so yeah. so I, I used 11s tuned to E flat. But what I found is that it's a great sound with a, with a partially distorted, you know, sort of semi broken up kind of tone, like a Stevie Ray Vaughan kind of tone. But when you start using high gain, 11s get woofy. Like especially on the G string and the D string, the string starts losing its voice and starts to go, you know, and I don't like that sound. I want sure. my strings to have a really good voice. And I found with 11s, it didn't, I couldn't get that with 11s using high gain. So I found 10s to be kind of a compromise to be, and I've been using 10s ever since. Okay. You know, I, I did try going lighter because I, I have had some issues with tendonitis in, in the past. And um, Bernie that just asked the question actually about string gauge um, gave me a set of eights to try. Mm -hmm. And because I was at his place and I played one of his guitars and I was like, man, this is so easy to play this guitar. Mm -hmm. um, who set this up? And he goes, oh, it's not the action. It's, it's the, the eights. And, and he gave me a, a pack to try and it was really comfortable for me to, to play. Well, and they're definitely the comfortable string of the ages. I mean, they, they're like butter. You know, oh, yeah. but oh, yeah. you know, you can fix that. You can, if, if the sound gets thinner, you can fix that by just using a different mic. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use a 57 with eights. Sure. I would use a Neumann 87 yep. like Holdsworth did because Holdsworth played eights. Yep. And to make up for it, he used a condenser mic, which is what we use for vocals. And the reason we use condenser mics on vocals is because the human voice is a thin sound. And, and if you use a 57 on a voice, it sounds pretty bad. It sounds thin. But if you use one of those beautiful condenser Neumann mics, it fattens up the voice and makes it sound really big. And it does the same thing for the guitar. So if you're using eights, use a condenser mic like a Neumann 87, and it'll be just as fat with t as tens using a 57. Sure. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. That 57 sounds quite nice on your voice right now, mate. Sing us a little song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> boo, 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 boo. <laughs> Um, now, Bernie is also asking about um, the loudspeaker in your cab. What type of loudspeaker do you use? Uh, green Greenbacks. Yeah, I've always really liked Greenbacks, though. I know Vintage 30s are cool, and, you know, I don't hate those. There's, those are nice. Um, vintage 30s, according to Rick Skillman at Celestion, um, Vintage 30s are made with the thinnest paper that Celestion uses. So that's why vintage 30s make that cone cry when you have them up too loud. You know how you'll be playing up on the high E and you'll hear little traces of a B flat along with it. And it's like ah, the speaker is choking and it's crying. And that cone cry is really not a nice sound. It's very, 
it's a very annoying sound. And vintage 30s are famous for that. So um, that's why I don't use them. But but um, I did use them on Tore Down House. And on the solo of Tore Down House, you can actually hear that cone cry. I play this high note and it's really blatant as fuck. And it's out there. And every time I hear it, I just go, oh, no. Great engineering, Scott. Like oh, really man. smooth. Good job. You know, I, <laughs> I I've got left it on there. My Marshall cabs have got a mixture of vintage thirty and mm. I always forget. Is it called GT seventy fives? Whatever the standard. Yeah, is. The, yeah. the regular seventy five yeah. sa- yeah. standard yeah. speakers. Yeah. And yeah. that's that whole E and O sound put together. That yeah, we talked about. Yeah, right? and and For I me. can see why that might be a cool combination. I've I've just been such a Greenback fan my whole life because that's what. Richie Blackmore used. That's what Jeff Beck uses. It's it's a sound I've grown accustomed to, and a lot of really great players use them. and And I've got and I've just always loved that sound. So it's the sound that I really am used to. Though I do have a cabinet with G H G twelve H's fifty five hertz. That's the speaker the Hendrix used, and I can hear by listening to myself play in those speakers, I see why Hendrix wasn't a big fan of his bridge pickup. He mainly played his neck pickup because those speakers on the bridge pickup are kind of nasty sounding, but they sound amazing on the neck pickup. They sound like Hendrix. Yeah, right. They sound, they have that Hendrix quality on the neck pickup. But since I mainly use my bridge pickup, I mainly use the you know, but I would definitely recommend if you're one of those guys that uses mainly your your neck pickup and you don't care about the bridge pickup that much, G12H 55 hertz speakers are amazing. You'll get okay. that Jimi Hendrix thing happening. It's 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 beautiful. Nice. That's the secret, huh? Um, just keep going through some of these questions. Uh, Scott, share with us some tips of your composition process. How do you connect different parts of your tunes and how... Do you develop different plans like harmony, theme, and counterpoint? With great difficulty. <laughs> That's all <laughs> I can say. Sleepless nights. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bad dreams, nightmares. Oh, boy. It's such a, that's such a broad question. And, and it, it literally, I mean, I have composition students that we spend, I've, composition students that we've had seven lessons and we're still talking about that stuff you know because it's so involved um in this day and age when any chord can go to any chord and if it sounds good it is good and nobody says you can't do it so for many years of transcribing uh writers like charles mingus and wayne shorter and joe zolinol and jaco pastorius Those are some of my favorite jazz composers, though I have my favorite rock composers as well. I'm really into Meshuggah. (laughs) Those guys are so badass. Yeah, yeah. I love the. I love them. They are so my heroes. Awesome. You know, I got to. I got to meet them at school one time. You know. Cool. Cool. I I got to ask them the question: Is your music in four four? And they said every note. It's it's all four four. It's just the accents are in really bizarre places, but and every try single and make tune more of it than, than really is going on there. Then every note they write is in four, four. And I was very surprised. And I was like, Holy shit. I never would have guessed. And they go, that's what most people say, but it's all in four, four, yep. but what a great band. What an amazing band they are. But um, anyway, so, so yeah, the composition thing, so much of it, just like the vocabulary of, of um, you know, improvisation comes from transcribing. So like if you have a tune and you're hearing it and you're going, why do I like this tune so much? You take it apart and find out what's making it tick. And you look at those choices that composer made and you try to go. The, the thing that should always be in your head is why didn't I think of that? That should be the first thing in, in your mind. Like, why didn't I think of that? Why did he think of it and not me? So you got to think outside the box to think of stuff that no one else has thought of yet. And that's a big part of it is learning to think outside the box, learning to do things that you would, you think are crazy, but cause they're not, you just think they are. Yeah. That's what it's really kind of about. Yep. Cause like I, I noticed like particular, like an example would be 
Anna Maria by Wayne Shorter. It's in the real book. You know, it goes da 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 da. Then it goes da, and that modulation right there, those two chords couldn't have less to do with each other. It's like not even in the same diatonic key. Those chords don't share any of the same notes. Yet he went there. And if you look at it in what I call stop time, where you're looking at it in just analyzing it, like I'm going to go blah, blah. That sounds horrible, right? I would never think to do that because I'm sitting here in stop time. You've seen stop animation, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine a, a film where, you know, stop animation, they move a, a little finger this much and they take another picture and then move it this much and take another picture. Yep. That's what you're in when you're in stop time. And you're analyzing it from the point of being in stop time. And it sounds terrible. But yet when you hear it in real time, it sounds beautiful. That's because it goes by so fast that you don't have time to think it sounds bad. And too many people write in stop time and they don't, they're not imagining what it's going to sound like in real time. So for me, I can't judge anything properly until I hear it played back in real time. So I don't waste my, I don't, I try to waste as little time as possible in stop time. I want to live in real time. So I write fast, I do it quick and I record it quick, and then I listen back. And the listening back of it tells me whether I like it or not. Because I sometimes hate it while I'm putting it in the computer. And when I hear it back, I go, wow. I never thought it would sound like that. Cool. It sounds great. Yep. Or really bad. <laughs> yep. Or the opposite. I thought, this sounds amazing. And then I record it, and I listen back in real time, and it sounds like shit. And I go, God. <laughs> so... So it's, it's experimentation and, and also st theft, grand theft on a grand scale because I have stolen so many small chord progressions from so many other musicians that I should be literally in jail right now. But they for, probably for stole theft. it from someone as well. Of course they did. Yeah. Of, yeah. You know goddamn right they did. Yeah. And that's why they say all great composers steal because we all do but you don't steal enough that you would ever be caught you know like you can't even you you can't even steal the first two chords of havona like that jocko tune on heavy weather you can't because it's like the first chord is e major 7 with the major 7th on top and the next chord is c major 9 with the 9 on top so you got an e flat major 7 with d sharp on top going to a c major 7 with d on top as soon as you play those two chords you know immediately that it's Havona. Those two chords are impossible to steal because they're so blatantly Havona. But if you steal some chords from the middle of the tune, that some note go into another note, no one's ever going to know where it came from. And then you've successfully stolen something and gotten away with it. That's nice, it. nice little tips there. Uh, yeah, I'm just getting through the uh, through the. the oh shit! Here. It's the police. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not the band. The Some other of the ones. People are getting sued for these days for having the the. Oh, what was it that someone got sued for for sounding having the vibe of a Marvin Gaye song or. I forget what the word. Well, you know, was. there's there are limits to what I mean. As soon as you start stealing too much of a melody, that's what they really get you for. Chords, not so much. But if you start stealing something that sounds like too much of a melody that someone is, else has written, you got a much bigger bigger chance of of getting in trouble for that than you do have chord progressions because, I mean, so many songs use the same chord progressions, just different melodies. Yeah. yeah. In fact. I have to say that this is pretty lame, but a lot of jazz musicians will take like the changes from s standards and just write a new melody on it and call it a new tune, which I think is pathetic, but they do it. Yep. And, yep. Um, and they don't get in trouble for it because you can't really copyright a chord progression, but you can copyright a melody. Sure. So a melody is the, the thing that's going to get you caught more than anything else. Yeah. 
So Barry has said here, changed my amp's power cable thanks to Scott, and man does it make a difference. I used a smaller gauge and all the extra bass I didn't need went away. Thanks again. Very, very true. Very, very true. I was a sucker for 10 minutes and I bought, I just used the regular amp cable that everybody uses and I bought one of those big thick ones and and I spent 10 bucks and it came in the mail and I thought, oh man, this is going to be great. And all it did was add a shit ton of bass to my amp. And I was really? like, this is the last thing I need. Yeah. Didn't make it sound any better. It just added a bunch of bass. It's stupid. So wow. I wasted 10 bucks. 10 bucks I'll never see again. I could have bought something to eat. <laughs> um, I'm scanning over a few questions here that we've already touched on, mm-hmm. such as six post tremolo uh, versus two post. Um, is IR. Sorry about, um, let me butt in for a second. I'm yep. sorry I didn't really get around to answering the composition question in detail, but it's because it's too much to go into. To t- I'd be talking for hours and and believe me, the transcription part will handle a big amount of it for you. If you just start taking tunes and transcribing them and look at them from more of a uh, analytical point of view and find out what some of those chords these people are using and start thinking like, okay, how much of this material is new? How much is repeated? When is he repeating it? How much time is going by before he repeats something? These little things that you learn from other music is really important. Modulations, are they using a note to modulate that's in both keys? Right? Like like a lot of Steely Dan tunes do and a lot of real book tunes do. They use what they call a pivot note just so you're you're on like one chord that and that interval is a different interval to another key and they use that note to pivot and modulate to another key. That's just a standard trick. And most people know that trick. Beatles tunes have it. Standards have it. Just about all the pop tunes have it. If they modulate at all these days, <laughs> usually they're just one key for the way. But anyway, so that's that's just wanted to put that in there because I couldn't, I can't talk all day about composition. It'd be. Do like, you have any videos uh, that you sell of you talking about composition? No, and you know what? I've been talking to the guy at my music masterclass because we thought like Scott, why don't you do a video on composition? And I thought I would feel kind of weird about doing a composition video based only on my own music. I would love to bring in my favorite composers on that lesson, but I have to find out how much am I able to use of their music before I break copyright infringement? Like, like, can I use four notes of one of their melodies and two chords or would that get me in trouble? So I really don't know the answer to that. I have to, I have to find that out before I do a composition video because I definitely wouldn't want to do it on only my material. I would want to bring in all my favorite composers, including pop composers and jazz composers and rock composers. And, but I would love to be able to use some examples of their music in the, in the lesson. And I don't know if I'm allowed to. Uh, I know YouTube's really bad for that. Rick Beato. um, You probably know of Rick. I know Rick. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, he's constantly getting copyright strikes for talking about various music and using examples of it. I've seen some of those YouTube videos that he does where he talks about pop composing and a tune, and I'm not surprised he's getting in trouble because he's blatantly using someone else's music to teach. Hmm. Now, even if he's not making a profit, he's still using their music, and that's forbidden. So if that band or that composer wants to, he can make trouble for him yep. and because that's his right as the owner of the tune. Yep. So that's what I want to avoid. Yep. But, uh, now, uh, some, some questions again, which we've already touched on. Does six post tremolo have a drastic tone difference with two? Uh, is IR any good in 2021? Muhammad, we already touched on both of those. Um, so, and he's saying warm regards from in- Indonesia. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I love please. Jakarta. I've got a tune named Jakarta. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, Muhammad, I, I invite you to go back, mate, if you've only just dropped in or if you asked that question before we touched on it. Um, love your music, Scott. Uh, 
Do David Brennan, do you have perfect pitch or do you have relative pitch and any ear uh, any pointers on ear training? Um, I, I don't have um, point, perfect pitch. I'm thank goodness I wouldn't want it because when you hear music that's out of tune, it just drives you up the wall. I've played with a couple of guys that have perfect pitch. They say you don't want it. It's a nightmare. Like if you go into a club and the jukebox is a little flat, you, you know, they say you just have to you run out screaming. So, <laughs> so, um, but I have pretty good relative pitch and I'd say that, um, I probably got it in a more organic way than an ear training class. Like I, I totally see the reason that schools have ear training class, because of course it's Im important to be able to recognize intervals, but I think I got my relative pitch from just listening to records and transcribing stuff off records. And I was always the guy in the band that had to like, you know, learn the tune that, w that we were going to learn and write a chart for it. So I had to learn it and write the chart. And I think just after doing that for so many years, I got to where I could hear things pretty well. And after years of playing with musicians, like I said, in a more conversational way, you need to hear whether someone just changed keys and what key he changed to and be able to figure that out really fast or um, figure out whether he just w just made it dominant or major or, you know, minor or minor major seventh or whatever it is to hear the difference in the qualities of chords. So, of course, ear training is really important. I just didn't learn it in a conventional way in a class. I learned it more by doing. Awesome. Awesome. Um and somebody has answered that for you. Scott has relative pitch. His mentor, Joe Zor Zorminal, I don't even know if I say that properly, is perfect pitch. Uh, yeah, Joe had perfect pitch. Yep. Yeah, and that, that was cool in one way because we were able to play duets. And I could just play any chord that I heard. And as soon as he heard that chord, he knew immediately what it was and he could play over it. So... We could make a duet sound kind of like a composition almost because it didn't it, it almost sounded like we were actually playing a song. If I ha was having a good night and played some decent harmony behind him, which some nights I didn't and I felt like a fool. But on the nights where I was having a good night and I played some nice chords behind him and he played all that amazing stuff, you would really think that it was that we were actually playing a song because he is the split nanosecond that he heard what i played he was playing wow and only people with perfect pitch can do that yeah yeah that must be awesome to play with guys like that uh another great interview that was a, and guest thank you yeah now, damon if you are appreciating these um people don't know about my show so please spread the word uh is what you can do to help out social media etc um what else we got here Okay, David Brennan says, I hate to say that I'm not too familiar with Scott's music. Any suggestions on what I should listen to first? Where yeah, you point my latest record. <laughs> Your latest record? <laughs> yeah, because I don't hate it yet. Okay, and where, where can we... <laughs> What is your In six record? months, and I will. In six months, I'm going to hate it. But right now, I don't hate it. Is it out yet? So, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the very the the last three records that i've done like um people mover is the last record that i've done you can find that on my website or on amazon um vibe station was the album that i did in 2015 i'm i still like that album well to the bone is the album that michael landau mixed uh thelma houston is on singing on that album and um and uh, those are my three latest solo albums and then another really cool album is the very last Tribal Tech album, Tribal Tech X. That's a pretty cool record. There's a lot of great stuff on that record that I, I still really like. And um, if you're into blues, I have this record called Dog Party. It, it, um, it's a song about dogs are singing blues to each other. <laughs> cool. If you're into dogs, you might like that record. And if you're into <laughs> blues, that's a straight ahead blues record. There's not a note of jazz on it, so you might dig that. If you're if you're a blues lover, nice, nice. I'm gonna have to go back and check out some of those myself. Um, now we've got a question here from uh, Michael Dolce, which is the guitar player on The Voice Australia over here. Michael's 
fucking fantastic player, mate. He was on, on the Gold Coast hey. here a couple of weeks ago and wow. got to hang out with him. Um, hey, Rick, and thank you, Scott, for the inspiration. You are the man. Do you thank ever you. use digital amp sims for recording or practice? Yeah, I, I mean, for practice. I've, I've, I, I'm, I'm kind of a stickler for tube amps when it comes to actually recording. Um, I'm not saying that... Um, anything bad about amp modeling because believe me a good amp modeler sounds better than a bad amp any day of the week so <laughs> no i'm not a purist like a friend of mine his name is dizzy dan, dan zimmerman he did uh his last solo album or not this last one but the solo album before this um he did it with a kemper and he did it with this guy's basement profiles and i think this guy is pretty famous on the web for his basement profiles and dan used his own pedals i believe he used an rc booster and he might have used an sd9 and some other pedals but he used the kemper and when i heard the album it sounded like a real amp to me and a good one it sounded really good and i was pretty impressed that he made this great sounding record with no real amp with a wow. kemper so know i know profiles? it can be done who, who was What's the profile that? maker who was the profile maker I don't remember his name, but Michael if you Britton. look up, it might be Michael. It might that sounds familiar. But this guy is really famous among the Kemper users for his basemen profiles. Okay, I and that up. that's what this guy. That guy. This is what he used. And I have to say, it sounded badass. It was really, really well done. A great sounding record. And that's the very first non-amp album by a guitarist that I've ever been impressed by. What I'm not impressed by is that fucking generic heavy metal tone that sounds really thin and sounds just like, it sounds like an amp modeler. You know, it, it just, it is an amp modeler. I can just hear it in a second and go, oh God, that's the Axe Effects. You know, and, and, and I honestly think my little Korg Pandora for $200 sounds better than one of those things. But I will say that I have not yet heard the Axe FX 2, and I've heard that it's greatly improved and three. that I will like it. They're up to three, three. now. Sorry, three. Yeah. It was three. Yeah. Because the yeah. the guy that um, that I'm working on with the IRs has one, and he says, I bet you you're gonna, you would like it. Cool. And he might be right. You know, I've only heard the very first version. I didn't care for it very much. Yeah. But now they're up to three, and I'm probably sure it sounds way better, and I it might change completely change my mind. But, um, yeah. I, I had I had uh, the version, the, the Axe FX Ultra, when that came out. And, uh, man, I tried to get that to sit in a track for weeks. Um, and I ended up getting a little Eggnator tweaker head, put a mic on it, and in two minutes I had the sound I was looking for. I'm told that the new ones, the Axe uh, FX3 is really up there now. So Michael that, that asked the question, uh, as I mentioned, plays on the voice. And he was using Axe FX2 right up until recently. Mm -hmm. uh, and he swears by the, the 3 as well now. So um, I didn't get yeah, to check well, that out. A lot, of, a lot of people do. And I'm, I'm looking forward to checking it out. I might really like it. But I'm, I'm still, I mean, I'm kind of old school. So when I record, I know I'm going to be using my Marshall. And, and, um, it's gotten me even a long way to, to even tell people and admit that I would actually use an IR instead of a real speaker cabinet. But I'm so confident in this new technology that, that my friend is developing and that I'm also working on with some other people that make IR related stuff. I'm sorry to be so secretive, but I, I can't talk about it that, yet. That's fine. Cause that's it's, fine. Yeah, yeah. but, but I just know that it's going to be the real deal. Like you are not going to be able to tell the difference. It's going to be deeper. It's going to be more three D. That's the thing I don't like about IRs. They always sound flat to me, and they always sound like they put the mic in the wrong place. Sure. Like yep. and 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 I'm always thinking that sounds like a crappy speaker cabinet. And so we're going to fix all that. Great. And Great. it's going to sound amazing. And we're talking. Maybe even before the end of this year, we'll we'll have it out nice. and ready to buy. Nice. So, you know, when I had Steve Stevens on about a year ago, um, he uh, I I'd just seen him play uh, in Brisbane here a few weeks earlier. Great player. Oh, uh, yeah, and nice guy, man. I couldn't believe how, how yeah nice yeah he was I know he's he's I've known yeah he's a good guy, man. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, 
and I, I said to him, man, your tone. And he was going, well, I've just switched to using speaker IRs. And he said, I'll never, I'll never mic a cab live again. And uh, Boss Tube Amp Expander is what he was using. Mm-hmm. And he just said the first time he tried it, his sound guy just over the mic said, dude, you got to come out, come out here and fucking listen to this. And he said he walked out and played and just went, whoa, there it is. There mm-hmm. it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm very I excited heard, to hear what uh, you've got brewing. I heard Jennifer Batten play one time at MI and she was using, uh, I can't remember. Blue guitar. What amp kind of, amp it might be. I yeah. can't remember, yeah. but, but. She wasn't, she didn't have a cabinet on stage, yep. but the one thing I have to say about that, and one negative thing I have to say is that if you're going to go there into that technology, better have some decent monitors because mm-hmm. if you go into that, if you go with that technology into some club where a bunch of thrash bands have been playing there and just completely destroyed the monitors and they're just on their last legs, no matter how great your shit is. You're going to have to hear yourself through those trashed monitors and it's going to be a drag. Yeah. And so using that kind of technology, you're almost forced to bring your own monitors with you that sound really good. And there are a lot of great sounding monitors out there. Was it B-E-U-R? And and, um, there's some other Myers some wonderful monitors out there that you that, that are heavy but you could bring them with you but in a way what's the difference if you have to carry around that shit why not carry around a speaker cap yeah yeah you know it's like not much different they're still heavy as hell and you're gonna have to carry them around with you because you cannot count on the monitors that you're going to find in some random club because they're probably going to sound like crap they usually do so, so I, I that's the downside on, of that i had jennifer on about a year ago as well and uh, she was just loving her blue guitar amp one, which is a floor mm-hmm. floor amp with yeah, uh, yep. And I've had Thomas Blue uh, on the show as well. Um, oh, you have? I yeah. have. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Isn't uh, he from Germany? He is. I met him in Germany yeah. a couple of years ago. I went to a YouTube event over yeah. there, and yeah, Thomas is a super nice guy. Um, My friend Cliff Coltrary, who used to be on Relativity Records, he used to be the head of relativity records as tribal tech did one album or maybe two albums for them. Yeah. He is the rep, the American rep for blue. Okay. Amps. Okay. So he was talking to me at one point and, and about them. Yep. And I, I was saying, should I be interested in this? And he said, no, <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, I know your tone and I know you and you're not going to dig it. So sure, don't even sure. go there. Yeah. So th- th- only because, he knows I like a, a. I'm playing through a 412, and I like this big thing. And and he says class D because that's what that is. It's yep. class D. And he says you're not going to get what you like from a class D amp. And yep. the only thing you're going to be happy with is a Marshall. So don't think that you're going to. That's going to change. Sure. I would be <laughs> and using he's the one. Rep. And Thomas has tried to line up <laughs> several times for for me to get one through the Australian distributor. Uh, and uh, get it in my hands, and then the guy keeps, you know, week, a few days later saying, "Yeah, are you done with that, mate? Need it back now." I'm just like, oh, "There's a mis- miscommunication going on here, mate." Mm. Um, and I just don't well, tell do you, it. in the hands of Jennifer, it sounded amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She got, of course, it's all in the player's hands anyway. I've seen Mike Landau play just about every amp you can think of, and it always sounds like Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I had a bit of a, an EVH chat last week and a friend of mine, um, Dave Leslie, plays in an Australian group called The Baby Animals who opened for Van Halen back in 92 on the For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge Tour. And he said, mm-hmm. you know, he'd be jamming with Ed backstage playing through some pissy little amp. And he goes, man, it just, it's in his hands. It's just in his hands. Of course it hands. is. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, I'll just keep going through some of these questions. Um, okay, a lot of shout outs saying people have seen you and how great it was. Will Tribal Tech ever get back together again from John Ash? <laughs> no, no. no. Uh-uh. Okay. No. Um, Scott, I plan to sell a kidney to buy a Sir Scott Henderson model. Is the production model, <laughs> is the production model guitar as good as yours? It's exactly the same. Exactly the same. Yeah? And that's the only reason I would ever put my name on it is because I've been through this with other guitar companies. And if you buy a Sir Scott Henderson model, 
there won't be one tiny bit of difference from the guitars that I get from Sir because that's what they are. They're just Scott Henderson stock. There's nothing different about my guitars than than uh, than what you would buy. That that's nice to know because there are certain signature artists out there who have signature models and they're not playing it like. I don't want to name. I don't want to say the name, but there's a. a I don't either because it's kind of an insult to the company you're working for when you do that. Yeah, yeah. Now there's a, a somebody I was really into back in the, the early '90s who had a certain signature guitar, and the company made his signature guitar, but he wasn't playing that. The guy that developed some other part of it, signature of it, also made his personal guitars for him. It's like, yeah, okay, he's not actually playing the the, the brand that he's endorsing. There's a bit of that goes on. I could tell you a funny story, but I don't know if I should or not. Because why not? Why not? It's just, it's just you and me. It's isn't just, it? it's just funny. It's just you and me. Nobody else is going to hear it. So, so back in the day when I was with Ivanez, right? They made me this guitar, and there wasn't one thing Ivanez about it. Really? It was a Fender Strat body, and and and. My choice of pickups, which at that time I believe was Seymour Duncan fifty nine in the jazz on the on the neck, and it was a Trev Wilkinson bridge. <clears throat> Nothing that has anything to do with Ibanez, and I played that guitar for about a year, and it was a decent sounding guitar, not bad, but they tried to put they wanted to put it out as a Scott Henderson model, and they wanted to put a Floyd Rose on it. And use these other pickups, and and I was and I just said no, I you can't do that because that's not the guitar that I'm playing. You have to clone this guitar and put that out as a Scott Henderson model, and they wouldn't do it. So that's why I left Ibanez. But the funny thing of the story is that for about a year, I was trying to tell them that, and this is back in the '80s. I was trying to tell them. Guys, don't you know that, I mean, don't you, have you heard of Jimi Hendrix? Like, do you know why those guitars sound so good? Why do you, are you making these piece of shit guitars that sound like ass? Like, don't you know what makes a guitar sound good? And, and why aren't you trying to make a guitar that sounds good? Because I'll help you, you know, just put some decent pickups on it. Use a real bridge. Just the kind of normal things that you'd think of. And the funny thing is that 25 years later, that's what they're doing. Yeah. If you see the guitars they're making now, they're really vintage. They're Andy Timmons is playing one. Mm, you know, mm. a lot of great players are playing them. They're good guitars. They're like, but it's like, I was telling them this shit 25 years ago. Yeah. Why, why yeah. are they just now seeing the light that people want good sounding instruments? Because that and was what, just what now was popular that, back it, then. Popular back People then. wanted the Floyd Roses back then. Um, I guess. Yeah. And there was now all that skinny see, neck. And to me, a skinny yeah. neck just sounds shit, man. A big fat neck for me. Well, now they now they're seeing the light because they're making this guitar, these guitars that are really vintage. I'm sure they sound great, and and uh, you know, it just took them 25 years to get there, but better late than never, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, Scott, I'm not sure what this one means, mate. This is somebody um, that knows something I don't. Uh, Edmund Wee says, "Big fan here, Scott. Thank you for the, thank you for immortalizing all the Eds out there in your jazz rock mastery instructional." I don't know what that means. <laughs> that means I was talking about this guy Ed in one of my videos. I was emphasizing about Ed doing it with his girlfriend and how you could kind of express that same feeling with what you play. Okay. And then, yeah, it was, it's, I, I'm hearing about that a lot. This Ed yeah. guy's, he's made a good career for himself. This guy He's had a lot of sex. <laughs> I need to change my name to Ed. <laughs> yeah, um, we all do. Let's see. Uh, just going through all the signature Sir guitars are, are the actual guitars the artist plays. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Dude, I think you had run out of questions. No, no, no. I've got. There's just so much that I'm going through. It's a lot of people <laughs> saying how much they, they love you playing and loving this chat. Chat from oh, Mark Savola. Sure, there. appreciate it, man. Thank you. Um, Batten is great. Was able to meet and watch her. Yeah. 
No, it's it's that I've got so much to scan through there. That's that's why. Okay, that's the end of all of it there, folks. If you've got any more questions for Scott, now's the time to drop it. Uh, drop it in the comment section. Um, yeah, because it's getting pretty near dinner time. It for is. Me. It gotta, is, man. It is. I, gotta, I always say to people, I, I, no, I didn't ask you before we started if you had a cutoff time. Um, no, nah, I'm I'm happy to. You know, I love talking about music and it's fun. And, uh, you know, I sort of look at it, if there's anything I can do to make somebody's life easier as far as just helping them with music and stuff. I mean, I know I don't teach for free. And if you want to take a lesson, it's a hundred bucks. But just shooting the general guitar shit and helping people maybe save money by not wasting their time with some gear that doesn't sound great or something like that. Uh, guys, I have a message board. Um, and it's, it's, um, I don't quite know, but if you just look up Scott Henderson direct on the web, um, you can join that message board and ask questions. And that message board has been going for almost 15 years. And we've talked about just about everything there is. If you want to know anything about a certain setting that I used on an album or, or my opinions about certain gear, I don't believe there's anything we haven't talked about i could probably turn that into a book about this thick and it's just sort of my way of giving back to the guitar community for all the people that have helped me because i had some serious help and i've been so clueless all my life about how do you do this how do you do that and i've had so many people who unselfishly shared their stuff with me and i'm just trying to pay it back Nice one. Nice one, mate. Uh, that, there has been a few more questions pop up since I posed the question just be before. Uh, and Mohammed said, Scott, we need more of you in Guitar Wank. I'm not sure what, if that's... Uh... Oh. Well, well, I haven't... First of all, Guitar Wank is a weird thing because, first of all, Bruce doesn't live in L.A. He lives in San Francisco. What and is Guitar Wank, so, right? Guitar Wank is a podcast that we do. Okay. And it's, we've been doing it for about four years. And um, we've had a lot of great guests on. We've had some of the pretty amazing jazz guitar players. We've had a lot of guys on there. Um, and some good rock players, too. You know, and some manufacturers. We've had John Sir on the show. We've had the CEO of Fender. Um, it's pretty interesting. Nice. And and um, But it's been harder to do with COVID. And we've done some stuff on Zoom. Doesn't quite feel the same. Um, we've had some guests on and uh, sometimes we've had some guests on that I don't want to mention any names, but they haven't been all that funny and we're kind of into funny on that show. So once it gets serious, it, it's like, uh, it's, yeah, that's not what we're about. We're about like cussing and telling dirty jokes and being really nasty and dirty and uh, politically incorrect and, fun. and, and calling Trump fun. a piece of shit and yeah. you know, just stuff like that. Right. And, and so, so we haven't been doing it as much lately just because the COVID thing, it's harder to get together. It's harder to find time for it. Cause I've been writing and Bruce has been really busy and, but it's still going and we will get together again soon as soon as we can, you know, as soon as we make an appointment to do it. Cool. Cool. Uh, Jimmy Ray Hawkins wants to know what pick brand and gauge do you use? Oh, just Fender heavies. Yeah. Um, um, I, I use this part of the pick, um, this part, you know, the top part. I, oh, I don't cool. use the point. Yep. I, I turn it around and I, Mike Landau showed me this Yeah. and I use it. I use the big part cause it sounds much more like your finger. Cool. Sometimes I use like the top edge of it to scrape the string on the top edge. Yep. And sometimes you use the flat part to just pick the string normally. But if I hold it in just the right way, I can't hear that much of a difference between that and using my actual finger, which is really where the best tone comes from. But if I use the point, I definitely hear it get thinner. And so a lot of people use the point just because that's what they've been told to do. And if you turn the pick upside down and use the other side, um, it it really does sound better. Man, it makes sounds a big difference, doesn't sounds it? Sounds fatter. I, yeah, sounds fatter. Yeah. I use, oh, where's my shape? These things called chicken picks. Um, uh-huh. And I'm using, I got, got them all over the place, but they're different shapes. The one I use 
is almost like this, a, a rounded version of this. Let me just change my camera angle. Um, cover my face. There we go. So mm -hmm. it's like a big corn chip, but uh, not the pointy one. There's one that's got more rounded edges than that. And mm -hmm. I've been using that. Man, the sound I get from that. Now, Bob Spencer from, he's an Australian guitar player, Roast Tattoo, um, all those kinds of bands. He brought it up saying, oh, I use these things, chicken picks and the sound. It's like, funnily enough, that's what I've been using. Definitely sure is a different sound when you switch to a different pick. It's oh, like a whole other yeah, world. Yeah. Took me a while to get used to using that, but now anything else, and it just sounds thin. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I'll just scan through the questions because there has been a few more come up. Uh, what's your favorite jazz song standard ever written? Oh, geez. There's so many good ones. I mean, I'm such a big Wayne Shorter fan, so almost everything that he's written, I am I really love. And back in the days when he was writing shorter tunes, which could fit in the real book, you know, nowadays he's writing this these massive fusion-oriented tunes that would be like 10-page charts. Um, but back in the day, he wrote a lot of beautiful stuff. Anna Maria is a beautiful tune, Beauty and the Beast iris orbits miyako they're all gorgeous and they're all in the real book and that's what's so cool about it um and and what's cool is they're very refreshing when you look at the other standards in the real book because the traditional standards are not really not that they're not nice tunes too but they're very 251 based they're basically a lot of 251s thrown together with a melody, which I don't have anything against, but that's very traditional. Wayne's music is very untraditional. He doesn't use many 251s. His, his thing is much more modern. And he was a big influence, along with Miles Davis, in modern, what they call modern jazz, where they're getting away from the bebop 251 thing and getting into more modern chord progressions. And that's kind of where my heart is. Okay. I'm not a big 251 guy. Sure. I don't sit around playing Stella by Starlight or all the things you are, even though I can. I just, I find that music very vanilla compared to other music I listen to by other composers. Okay. So, um, not that I have anything against simple music because I love blues and I'll listen to a, a, for some reason, I'd rather hear a 12 bar blues than a 251 fiasco. Okay. I love the 12 bar blues for some reason, because I think it's in my heart and soul because I grew up listening to it. Sure. But when I hear a tune, a standard with just like someday my prince will come with like just a bunch of two fives thing or moments notice or stuff like that. It doesn't appeal to me very much because I didn't grow up in the 40s and 50s. I didn't grow up in that era. I, I grew up listening to Led Zeppelin. Sure. So yep. I didn't grow up listening to two five ones. Okay. So, Speaking of so, blues, you know, Edmund Wee is asking, will you consider putting out another blues album? He said he loves Tore Down the House and Dog Party. Oh, Both well, the thanks. tones I, are, and playing were just smoking. Thanks. Um, well, you know, I'm just hoping to try to um, to do everything I love in each album. It's, it's very hard for me to um, spend a whole... It, it takes a long time to do a record. You have to really live with it for a year or so. And it's real hard for me to sort of take the other seven tenths or <laughs> or nine tenths of me away from me and only content concentrate on one tenth of what I do. Because as much as I love blues, I love so much more than, than that. You know, like I have to have a funk tune or at least a couple funk tunes on my record. I think I've just portrayed the universe. Yeah. I can't do it. Yep. I have to have some rock on there. I have to have some really nice harmony. And I sort of feel like I have to be me. And me is everything that I love. And I don't just love blues. And that's what was kind of hard to do that. One, I think one of the reasons that doing Dog Party was okay is because we did it in three days. We went in, recorded the songs, overdubbed, and mixed it. Well, it took more time to mix it, but we all the playing and all the notes were were created in three days. That's it. Yeah. Awesome. So if I ever did do an, another blues album, that's how I would make it. Cool. I would cool. just go into the studio, play it, no overdubbing, no nothing. What you get is what you get. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it. 
<laughs> you know, there's something spontaneity that just that just wins. It's just something when you, know, you just go in there, and you don't think about things too much. Just go in there and do it. And yeah, people overthink things. They do, and there, but but there is also another hat that I like to wear, like this one, like my Rams hat. Let's hope they do better this year than they did last year. But um, um, and that's production, and I love production as as much as I love notes. And there's there's hours can go by in the studio where I'm having so much fun. Like, what sound am I going to use? I'm going to go through all my plugins, sound toys, and. You know, I'm going to go through all the Echo Boy presets and I'm going to go through all my pedals. I have literally over 200 pedals. So, and I'm going to use every one of them. And what and, door do you and, use? And, and, huh? Which door? Which, door? which, which Pro Tools? Pro Tools. It, oh, it, I use a uh, digital performer. Oh, cool. Yeah, okay. Yep. Just because just I'm used to it. I've been using it for years. So, I, you know, yep. it works yep. for me. But, um, but yeah, you know, just coming up with all those sounds and layering is such a fun part of it and it is not stuff that you have to do spon that you do spontaneously it requires a lot of thought and planning so that's what production is about whereas a record like dog party there's no production yeah. <laughs> you just go in and play and it's done cool right cool so so sometimes i think the difference between like theater and making a movie is where I imagine for some actors doing theater is wonderful because you just go on and you got one chance to do it and you just do it and then it's done. Yep. But how much fun must it be to be James Cameron or somebody who makes this amazing film with all the effects and all the takes and all the editing and putting it all together and, and, and creating a masterpiece, right? Yep. So sometimes when I feel like I'm making a record, I feel like that's what it must feel like to make a movie because I'm not taking the first take. If I play something that I don't like it, I don't have to use it because yep. no, there's no law that says I have to take the first. I'll play as many goddamn takes as I want until I'm satisfied with yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and when I make a record, sometimes that's I'm more in that frame of mind. Let's get something that you really like, that you really can look back on and be proud of. Yep. You gotta and, live with it. And if you want and if you want to hear me fuck up, go buy my live album. <laughs> because because man, I'm fucking up like crazy and playing wrong notes and making terrible decisions and like <laughs> it's like a fest. It's yeah. like a fuck fest, a cluster fuck. Yeah. And you can buy that if you want to hear me at my worst. <laughs> Scott, I am trying to breeze through all the questions because I, I do realize right. we've been going for quite a while now. Uh, do you keep your nails on your right hand a little longer for hybrid picking? No, I, I I'm um, I probably should because you know the hybrid picking thing is cool. But but what happens? I don't know why. Um, maybe not enough vitamin D or something or vitamin A, but. I always split my nails when I do try to do that. And I always get a string caught in my fingernail and it's fucking painful. Ugh. And, um, so I keep my nails short because that always happens to me. Yep. Yep. Cool. Scott, I'm going to round it up, mate. I want to say thank you. Um, not just for myself, but on behalf of all the viewers that were watching as well. Um, Rick, thanks. I mean, I didn't expect to go this long, um, and I hope I haven't been just extremely boring. No, not but at all. I, I really appreciate you having me on, and it's been a pleasure talking to you. And these are fun things that I like to talk about. So yeah, it's absolutely. all good. Yeah, it's more um, cutting it off. You said you've got to go get some dinner and stuff. Yeah, it's, I, I always eaten say all to people, if I got <laughs> an hour hungry. out of you, I'd be happy. Uh, but the average length of these has been three hours. And when I bring up to people, oh. it's been three hours. They just go, really? It feels like half an hour. But that's when you love Well, that's great. Guitars. I hope mine's like that. I hope people aren't like sticking sewing needles in their eyes after the first half an hour. <laughs> you know? but as I said at the start to, to people, these are available on all the podcast sites. So you can just listen to them. And uh, I get messages from guitar builders, et cetera, around the, around the world saying, man, I, I, I can't watch you because I'm working away on stuff, but I love listening to your stuff. So um, yeah. Keep that in mind, folks, that you can find me well, on the podcast great, sites. Rick. And then thanks for keeping the guitar community alive. I, we, I know how that feels as being a podcaster myself. 
and having multiple guests on the show sharing their knowledge and information about music and it's 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 great that we can do that in this age of technology it's awesome absolutely absolutely so scott i thank you again and the round of applause for you <laughs> yeah yeah so you, i actually heard life. a couple girls in the audience that's not something i'm used to well mate you said you haven't played live in a while and and just with the current situation it's going to be a little little while uh, again so um you know we, we all miss that we all miss that so you know uh, I, I got my, my cans. I'm, I'm waiting for March, man. I can't wait to get out there and tour again. It's going to be so much fun. Mate, you, you enjoy that applause so much that I'm going to give you another one. And I'm going to hit my little button that says end screen right here. You know, I've got this controller that controls everything. And I used to have end broadcast button on there. And I was talking to, do you remember Thomas Mc, Thomas McRocklin, the little kid that was in the Ibanez ads back in the 80s? Steve yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. I do, yeah. Have you heard him play now? No. Oh, fuck me. He's great. He, 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 he gave up guitar amazing. for 20 years. And Jeez. he picked it back up five years ago. And uh, Anyway, I was doing an interview with him and I fumbled my controller and I accidentally hit the end broadcast button halfway through it. So I immediately took that off here. So now when I want to end something, I actually have something that says end screen and I have to physically go through it. So I'm going to hit the button right now. Thanks again, Scott. Thank you, Rick. It's really been a pleasure. And thanks for the listeners. And, you know, I really appreciate the support. Thank you very much. Awesome. Here here comes my wicked logo. logo.